Good one. Good evening and welcome to the June 22, 2015 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, could you please call the roll? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Wood? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. Thank you. We'll note that with the full board this evening, Ms. Oglis and Mr. Bealey will be non-voting members. Next item is approval of minutes from the June 1st, 2015 meeting. So moved. Second. We have a second, and I think we may have a proposed amendment. All right, just just a uh, clarification on um, under the investor housing. Um, it states that I felt it was a great opportunity, and I was not opposed to parking in the front of the building. And basically, what I was trying to get across was I had read somewhere where there was because of the historical significance of the structure, there was some issue with parking in the front of the building, and I wanted. To give the applicant an uh, opportunity to clarify that. So I, I don't really have a position one way or the other regarding the parking at this point. All right. <coughs> Thanks for that. We need to move on in a, an amended. <coughs> move on the minutes as amended. So moved. So second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Is that unanimous? <laughs> Item number four, Michael and Lorraine Scammon, 39 Ingleside, Dr Ingleside Drive, request an advisory opinion for an appeal from restrictions on non-conforming use, Assessor's Map R50, Lot 24C. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, see, the Scammon's proposal is before the board tonight for an advisory opinion to the Zoning Board, to the zoning board of Appeals because the current use of the site is a non-conforming uh, use. It's a single-family home in the Haggis Parkway District, which is not permitted, but is a grandfathered non-conformance. Um, in compliance with Section 3F of our ordinance and Section 4, a non-conforming use may be expanded and converted to another use only if the expansion is approved by the ZBA in, in light of the review, review criteria in the sections I mentioned before. Section 3 generally provides sort of broad neighborhood context type uh, review criteria. Section 4 gets into mu much more discrete review uh, criteria for the board to consider. Uh, staff will just note that I think it was back in April of 2013, this applicant was before the board with a similar yet slightly different request, at which time the, the board had uh, provided a favorable advisory opinion. I believe the applicant even went on to get Board of Appeals approval. My understanding is things have changed um, for the applicant's needs or wants, and so they are taking a slightly different tack than was originally proposed, and I'm sure the applicant is prepared to uh, highlight those changes to the board. Um, with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, Walter Wilson from Design Company. Uh, I'm representing the Scammons in this application. They have an existing house. Uh, it was built in 1998, and um, they want to take and add another unit to the house. Now, like Jay said, previously he was in, and we got approval for a um, uh, accessory use. Uh, there's been some family health problems since then, and they couldn't build it until now. And some of the health problems are going to require a slight change in the building size. It only amounts to about 120 square foot difference in size. And it also includes some outside ramps for handicapped access and so forth. <coughs> um, the Scammons are going to take in their mother-in-law with her companion, and they're in their 80s, and they're going to take care of them and they need the addition for that use. Also, the Scammons want to take and enlarge their existing house um, kitchen area and so forth to make it a little bigger. Uh, the thought is that in a few years, they may be occupying the additional unit 
and one of the children in their family will take over the main house and take care of them. So originally it was approved as, a, as an accessory use. And the problem came in this, not only in the, in the medical conditions of the family, but they're thinking they had um, originally it was proposed for their mother-in-law and so forth. Um, now they are thinking they may end up being in the accessory use later on themselves and their children, uh, one of the children in their family would take over the main house. And they're concerned with the accessory use limitation on only two people allowed in the unit. And so the reason for the reapplying is to have it converted with the few changes that were made, which are, like I said, are very slight, and also have it uh, changed <coughs> to an expansion of a non-conforming use single family to a non-conforming use two family, uh, which alleviates the accessory use only two people in the house problem that's in the ordinance. Um, the existing house is, uh, contains about 2,360 square feet, and they want to expand that to 2,886 square feet. The additional unit will occupy 1,156 square feet. The property is 3.9 acres in size. And the finished product will have a total of 4,588 square feet, including the two units, the porches, the decks, the carport, and access ramps. And that proposed building coverage will occupy 2.7% of the property in size. Um, all the other requirements as far as setback and so forth will be met, as you can see on the site plan. The, uh, the house is over 300 feet in off Hagus Highway, so you don't even hardly see it from the road. Um, it has access from Hagus Highway and also from Ingleside Drive. There's two means of getting in and out. And um, I don't know if any of you are aware of it or know the property. There's some ponds that surround the property, and there's the adjacent piece has some recreational summer use to it, which is part of the Scammons family, which is the reason why they want to maintain their residence there because of the, uh, the holdings in the family and the recreation area around them. So the request is to change it from a single family to a two family. And like Jay said, there's hardly any change to it from the original one that was here two years ago. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, before we turn to board discussion, um, there is the opportunity for public comment if anyone would like to come up and speak. Seeing none, we'll turn to the board. We'll start, Ron. Yeah, uh, I only have one question, um, and that is on: uh, uh, is it on a septic system? Yes, it is. Is it big enough to to accommodate an additional unit of that size? The the testing had for this existing system is satisfactory. They're going to have to do about a 10 percent enlargement for the additional use, which the owners are aware of, and they'll have the required. Uh, uh, design systems for the uh, planning board, uh, for the uh, building inspector before uh, they do any construction. Other than that, I don't, you know, I commend them for their intentions and... Thanks, Ron. John? No, oh, I'm okay. This is kind of a victim of the zoning change. It wouldn't be before it if it wasn't for that. So I'm good with it. Thank you. Mike? Uh, I'm in favor of a uh, positive uh, opinion to the zoning. <coughs> Board. I think they've answered all the questions satisfactory, as outlined in the uh, in the material. So, I'm thank you, it. Nick. I have no questions. Okay. Roger. No. Susan. I'm fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Likewise, I'm fine. I appreciate the brief presentation, and um, seems pretty straightforward and minimal change. And best of luck. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. So I. We don't really require a formal vote. It's an but advisory opinion. Summary statement would be. So, um, just for the record, it's clear based on board discussion that we have unanimous uh, support for this, and we'll send that along to Correct. the zoning board. Correct. Thank you. Next item: Scarborough Fish and Game Association, 79 Holmes Road, requests an advisory opinion for an appeal from restrictions on non-conforming use, Assessor's Map 33, Lot 1. Jay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, very similar to the application the board just saw, but for the type of use we're talking about. 
um, again, this application before the board for an advisory opinion to the Zoning Board of Appeals because the current use of the property is a non-conforming use within the rural farming district. Again, uh, sections three and four spell out sort of the review criteria in both general and specific terms as to uh, the review items for the board to weigh in on and the ultimately the zoning board to take action on. Um, staff, um, really just, to, you know, the, the applicants really before you for, to add a couple of sheds as well as to expand a kitchen area with one of the disciplines out on the site and I guess, you know, just really want to be sure we're understanding the full utility of that kitchen and, and what that means to the site, um, be sure that it does still fit within these criteria. But outside of that, um, that's what I will just note, um, and I put it in our planner staff comments as well, that the applicant did receive it um, back in 2012. Uh, they did do some other storage sheds out there for some disciplines, and that received a favorable opinion at that time from the sports. Okay. Question for you before you turn it over. Yes. Did we not vote for something else, or was that was that 2012 that we voted to? They were going to build some additional buildings. Yeah, I think that was going all the way back to 2012, three, three years ago or so. Um, <laughs> and one one item I will just mention, um, I guess started it, so I'll say it now. Um, depending on how the board winds up with this, if you do do a favorable opinion um, or not, I suppose. However, it goes. Um, this item would require site plan review, ultimately, because it is a change of a non-residential use. Depending on how the board feels about this proposal, it might be worth a discussion if this is something the board felt could be handled administratively or if you do want to see it back um, before the full board. Um, this might be one way of having that clearly stated uh, moving forward. So with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And uh, welcome the applicant. Good evening. I'm Michael Kane. I'm the current president of the Scarborough Fish and Game Association. Uh, I would probably start out by saying in 2012, the previous administration came forward and they were going to build three storage buildings. They built one of the three. Okay. And what happened was that there was an unawareness and all the faults on us that once we started the first one, we felt that the other two then could follow. And when we raised the money, we came in and obviously we hit a deadline. And so we're reapplying for, for those and adding to it the kitchen and one other storage building that we, that we want to put on the property. So quickly in, in the process, uh, I've got this same map that you've got a plan in front of you there. And some of the very quick highlights, first of all, nobody can see our buildings. Our buildings are more than 500 feet away from any of our boundary lines, and you cannot see the building from Holmes Road or any residence or anything like that. We're, we're deep in the woods, as they say. Um, the plan also that you see in front of you, the three pages, that's also our DEP plan, uh, Maine Department of uh, Environmental Protection. Uh, we've been working with them for the last two years to put together what we would be considering our final plan with the DEP to make sure we're in compliance with all their rules as a uh, operating range. Um, I'm probably going to ask, are there any questions? That's probably the best way to proceed. I could talk for hours on this facility and <laughs> you don't want me to. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, and, and again, as with the last item, we have the opportunity for any public comment before we start any discussion. Once again, seeing none, we'll go back to the board. Susan, would you like to start? Um, I don't have much to say. I mean, I, I think that basically it's, it's what was applied for before, mm -hmm. except for the kitchen, and you've That's answered all of my questions yep. about mm -hmm. how the kitchen's going to be run and what it's going to be mm -hmm. used for, and so I really don't, I think it was, I may be so bold, but this is a really good application because it's complete. Thank and you. There's really not much to say. So thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm all set. Thank you. <coughs> Nick, I just have one qu clarifying question, and I don't know if Jay or somebody else might be able to help. But you did mention DEP. Um, this isn't something that needs any DEP permitting to go forward, does it? Not these. Not not oh. from not from for for this no. uh, not for this part not for no. this part of okay. the process. No. Yeah. And then I have no questions. Yeah. 
Thank you. Ron? No, I'm, I'm okay with it. John? I'm okay with moving this forward. I've got some questions when it comes back to us as far as the septic, but that's buying a question. But as far as okay. pushing this forward to the zoning board, no problem at all. On that, in that vein, and just to just to clarify uh, what you were saying before, Jay, were you suggesting that the board should weigh in on whether we want to we would want to see this back as a as a full site plan review, or whether they would delegate that to administrator re review? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. So, so we can open it back up for anyone who has yeah. an opinion on uh, that. John, what you have the floor now. I, I would be okay just to prove that the septic is okay because you know we're adding a kitchen. We're adding some more water, and then there's a possibility in the future, if they put in dishwasher, do they have to come before the code to put in dishwasher? I don't think they have to. They can just throw one in. So there's a little question on the septic issue. That's the only thing I have, okay. and that's not a – I think staff can take care of that as that goes on. I'm good with that. Great. Huh? My question goes back to the DEP. Do they have to get an additional certificate? Um, they're working no. through their amendment right now. That's um, correct. So, but you'll be happy if, you, if right. they present it to you, yep. and yep. then I'm still okay. Yep. okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, it can go administratively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Mike? Yeah, I'm fine with the proposal, and I agree. It's yep. a very complete package. Appreciate yep. that. Thank and you. I'd be happy with uh, the administrators taking care of the, uh, the site plan. Thanks. If I could, whenever you're ready. <laughs> Just one second. Any other thoughts down here about administrative review? Fine. Okay, thanks. When when the uh, sporting clays building was built, we knew we wanted to have a kitchen in, in sporting clays. Uh, the septic system for that building was built with that in mind. Uh, and in your packet, you have a letter from the civil engineer stating that the capacity of the septic system fulfills that requirement. The DEP piece that you have there is kind of unique, and if I could take just one quick minute on that. Sure. That, that DEP process is us working with the state to make sure that everything that we do on that piece of property fits into their purpose. So what you have actually in your packet is our 10-year plan, our complete plan for the site with the DEP. If everything goes right and we're able to raise money, the next project for us is to come back and we'll be adding to the size of our clubhouse, which is shown on there. Uh, right now, our clubhouse can hold approximately 75 people, and our membership has just gone over 1,000. So we're really squeezed in the clubhouse. And in order to do that clubhouse, and also we do a lot with the law enforcement community, I believe, what, the 40-some, yep, uh, law enforcement, and that's municipal, county, state, federal, and military all take part in the ranges that we have down there. Their request is to have a shoot house, it's a house they go into on purpose to train uh, for those incidents that would happen inside a house. They're asking for one of those bats in there. Uh, you had another group that came in that was talking about having a tower. That is also part of our DE process. We, we've got all of that wrapped up into this. So we know right now where we're at with all of that relatively to the next 10 years. Uh, we're about four weeks from actually having the permit signed. We've gone through all the meetings with DEP. They graciously took our check, and we're waiting for that result to come. Uh, the kitchen area is only serving the shooters. Right now what we do is we, we have, I don't even want to call it a kitchen, but a cubbyhole sink arrangement. Uh, we, we go outside. We, we actually put up a canopy, and our equipment that's under the canopy works by propane, and the cook is outside. And we're operational year-round. We have shoots in the wintertime, and so the food is prepared outdoors and then brought into the building. So we really want to get out of that mode if, if we can. Uh, the storage facilities that you see, there's three of them there. Their main purpose is to, is to store our little birds. For anybody that doesn't know what the sporting clays are, 
we shoot, or actually I like to say, we throw almost 800,000 of these a year. I don't want to tell you what we hit. <laughs> so, but but we're, that's the process. These are what's going to go into those storage buildings. So it's it's not a fire issue. They're a bio, biodegradable piece of clay. Uh, and with them would go in the, the throwing machines. Again, we don't want to leave those out right now. We, we pretty well cover them using vinyl. And we want to get all this stuff inside. So hopefully I've asked, answered all your questions. I yeah. just have one. Yeah. You said you have over 1,000 members. How many people do you have there at any one time? Any one time at the site, it can range anything from just five or ten in the middle of the week to on a weekend, if we've got a shoot going on, we'll say at Sporting Clays, we can see as many as 200 come to that shoot. Uh, trap is very similar to that. We could see 100, 150 come to trap. We do not plan our shoots so that they're all falling on the same weekend day for obvious reasons. We, we control the parking and everything else at the site because of that. And so basically on the busiest days we have there, I would say you can see 200 to 300 people on the site. So most of them have to stay outside, though, because you just said that the facility could probably handle about something. Yeah, absolutely right. One of our biggest dreams is, is to expand the clubhouse, but obviously that dream is a lot of money attached to it. And so we're, we're not going to be borrowing money. We're, we raise our money to, to build our buildings when we can afford them. And that's why we got caught with the 2012, because once again we raised the money to build the buildings and then forgot that we had a time limit on them, so. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, well, I, I appreciate that additional, I think we all appreciate that additional yep. information and context, mm -hmm. and uh, like my fellow board members, I don't have any issues with this, and I yep. appreciate the thorough package and presentation, and um, we will send a unanimously favorable advisory opinion forward, and mm -hmm. wish you the best of luck. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Item number six, Go Green Landscaping, Inc. requests a plan development review for development of property located at 4 Royal Ridge Road, Assessor's Map U37, Lot 18. Mr. Um, yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see, board members will recall we saw this item at our last meeting. Um, the applicant is before the board uh, for a plan development review of a five-acre parcel in the D3 district. The applicant has indicated that they, um, in the short term, would like to build out around a 12,000-square-foot uh, office and retail building. Um, but as we discussed last time, given the scale of the property, it requires to go through the master plan review process, or the plan development review process, I'm sorry, uh, which really is a three-step process. The first step the board conducted at your last meeting, which is the site inventory and analysis, which really identifies the uh, characteristics of the site, those areas that are unique and maybe should be preserved, and other areas that are ripe for development. Uh, the board was satisfied that the applicant had uh, conducted their site inventory analysis and requested they move towards the master plan phase, step two, um, which is what is before the board this evening. Um, within the B3 zone, there's a host of review criteria for plan development uh, projects that at this point the master plan is, uh, the board's defined that the master plan is consistent with those items, um, and so staff echo those in our comments for you. Um, within our comments, a couple of items that we flagged and noted for uh, the board to talk about uh, in regards to uh, the master plan language really seeks to ensure that development pattern is designed to create a sense of place, um, which really is at, uh, aimed at getting getting to that by uh, the orientation and design elements and amenities that are uh, within a master plan. Um, I think another item, and we, and we touched on this a little bit during the site inventory analysis, Phase. Master plan is to, uh, the board is to find that master plan is consistent with the design standards uh, for commercial districts. 
And one of the uh, sort of bigger items for the board to discuss and consider is the orientation of the overhead doors. Um, and so that was noted. Uh, we'll note that the applicant has been before the Board of Appeals for um, the uh, special uh, for the um, conditional use for outdoor storage areas. I think when the Board of Appeals reviewed that, they sort of recognized that the planning board, through the plan development standards and site plan standards and design standards, and sort of the multiple layers of review that this project would go through, the planning board has uh, much more discrete and defined processes for screening and locating outdoor storage. Um, and so, again, sort of the, the final orientation of that is, um, could be considered as part of the master plan process. Uh, also just flag some comments with regards to internal access and, and driveways. Um, but I think sort of those first two or three items that staff flagged really seem to be sort of the, the pre predominant items uh, in getting to a master plan discussion. With that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And uh, just on a procedural level, wanted to note, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but we had had some discussion at the last meeting about whether we might be able to combine master plan review and site plan review at this next meeting, this meeting we're having now. And the determination after staff checked into that was that we could not do that. Um, but um, hopefully we can keep moving things forward for you and see where that takes us. So. That will turn over to the applicant. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. I'm joined tonight by Mike Richmond from Custom Concepts and Dave Malevsky from Go Green Landscaping. Um, we're here to present to you the master plan, which is uh, quite similar to the one that we kind of looked at the last time. Um, just want to kind of reiterate some of the, the issues that we're dealing with. The, we're in the B3 zone which in our opinion is, is more written for Route 1 oriented businesses that, that are right up against Route 1 um, as far as architecture, orientation, that sort of thing. Uh, we're more than 400 feet back from Route 1 and the plan that we're showing shows that we are going to be, the parking will be screened from landscaping. The orientation of the building is, is situated in such a way that it kind of mirrors that curve in the road and it also allows us to stay um, as far away and have the least environmental impact to the wetlands that are on both sides of this than any other orientation that we could have. Um, we're also close to, to the utilities that are located in Royal Ridge Road. Um, as Jay mentioned, the ZBA did approve us. Uh, we got a special exception for outdoor storage. Um, the outdoor storage is located behind the building. Um, it will also be screened um, to the north and to the west. Um, with some landscaping that will be detailed in the site plan application. Uh, the intent is to be a paved surface with um, loam, bark mulch, um, maybe some crushed stone, some sand. Uh, so there's four areas that will be separated with a uh, concrete block basically to create each of those individual um, fins, so to speak, to keep the material so they're not mixed. The issue with curb cuts that was brought up in the staff memo talks about having all these curb cuts in, in close proximity to each other and we, we believe the staff's comment is very valid so what we're proposing to do is actually close this curb cut off and the main entrance would be in this way here. This would allow in the future, we're talking about a future connection to this when this road gets and if this road gets built out, we'd make a connection here for our, our second driveway. So we did take that um, staff comment to heart, and that's something we're looking forward to changing in the site plan application. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mike Richmond to uh, talk about the building architecture. Good evening, Mike Richmond, Custom Concepts Architects. Uh, after our last meeting, we've put some more thought into uh, the overhead door issue. And uh, basically, I mean, we, we fully respect that the ordinance was written you know, to protect the views of overhead doors from public way. Um, this right here is it, not a typical overhead door, or at least what you're used to by the term overhead door. Um, what we're trying to do here is in, create something that's barn-like or carriage-like, if you will. So we specifically designed it so that the doors themselves become part of the architecture. Um, 
basically a, fit the character they're building. So we want them to show. And quite honestly, you know, we, we know that the code discourages this, um, but really want you to consider it because having the doors facing as we have them is much, much better than the alternative. Thank you. that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. <coughs> Once again, uh, this is an item that has the opportuni opportunity for public comment if anyone's interested. <coughs> I don't see anyone, so we'll go to the board. Mike, would you like to start? Uh, sure. I like the improvements that you've made. Um, uh, we're basically, what, talking about a plan development here, and they're going to come back for a site plan? Right. Sure. Well, uh, I like the way the, the building's orientated. It, it, it looks like a, like a horse stable to me. And I think uh, a lot of people would probably find that to be attractive. In fact, that's what it was called. So I appreciate the effort you made in uh, dressing up the uh, doors. Now, do they open like overhead doors, typical overhead doors, or do they, do they open in another orientation? They would most likely open like a typical door, yeah. uh, but the new ones are pretty good. Yeah, I've, I've seen them. I can't afford those, but uh, okay. I've seen them. they're pretty nice. <laughs> and I, and I, I like the awnings that you have put over the doors and over the uh, over the windows, so uh, and the lights over the gold green landscaping sign. So I'm very pleased with your efforts. So very much in favor of it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. John, yeah, I'm uh, positive towards this project. Uh, the only thing I'm going to request is sidewalks. I'm sure you knew I was going to say that. Uh, looking ahead on other future possibilities in this site area, uh, connections to sidewalks should be necessary. We just approved the wellness thing a while back and never thought ahead that it could possibly be your building up the street, which at some point could be an office building. And maybe those people want to walk down the sidewalk and go get a massage at lunchtime. So, I know it's a sidewalk to nowhere at this point, but it's a connection for the future. And that's the purpose of the ordinance is to have these sidewalks put in. Other than that, I'm very positive. All set. Yeah, thanks. Ron? Yeah, I know it went to the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, and, but the only thing I'm just doing some reading that I'm not clear on is, if, from the historical point of view, is the uh, outdoor storage, how that's going to be done how it's going to be screened and lay out of that. Okay, so the outdoor storage area is located in behind the building. This is a driveway that we envision people coming up to. This is not um, retail sales. This is just for the landscape company itself to use for their use. So we're talking small 10 to 20 yards of, of material stored at one time, and it's screened on this side by landscaping. Off in that direction, there's, there's wetland, and then you go up the hill, and there's the uh, Plantation Drive subdivision. I think it's the Scotto Hill Woods subdivision. That's 600 feet. The closest house is 600 feet away, and up and through the woods. Um, this way, you're not going to see, there's nothing over here. This is all scrub brush, very thick. So there's nobody can see in this way. You can't see it coming from this direction. So I think we've done a pretty good job of screening it from just about every direction. We've got woods here. We have landscaping here, landscaping, and, and building. When, Lee, when you come back with the site plan, is, is there, how many employees do they expect to have initially? About 20. Is, is there going to be a layout for, for the safety of the employees, too? I mean, you, you've got units going in in the area you just described to me, but is there, is there a plan for safety in all of this as far as, uh, uh, let's call it pedestrian movement, even though it might be employment, employee movement, so that they're not going to be <coughs> knocking into one another? Um, yeah, I'm assuming they're going to just have trucks one at a time go in, they'll load, and then they'll leave, and the next one will come in. But you've got 20 people coming in and out of that building is what I'm getting at. 
briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Next. My name is David Malevsky, Go Green Landscaping. Uh, how we set up um, the beginning of the day each day is we stagger the crews coming in so that we don't have 20 all in at once, okay. trying to get out in their trucks. So usually it's four different start times that are separated by about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That's all I have. Wait. You all set? Yep. Right. Susan? Um, I <clears throat> just want to make sure that the um, master plan phase comments from staff, just going through them, that everything that we expect that you're going to be showing up with, you will have no problems with, right? We do all of this. Now, the street, like, street escape buffer strip yep. sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, I don't want to take the time right now. I just want to make right. sure no, that each one of these is in there. It right? is, yeah. I did check. I wanted to hear you say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is a very large improvement. I was concerned about outdoor storage. But it's one of those things that we get pretty picky about. But I think that this ought to work out just fine. Um, I don't see any problems going forward. And when we get to the site plan, we'll get much more needy yep. and pretty picky because we're very good at that. Okay? No problem. Thank you. Roger? Um, just one question regarding the parking on the um, the front of the building. So all basically all the parking, the the employees as well as um, any vehicles, you know, company vehicles or everything's going to occur right in front of the building there. Yeah. So this this part, this dashed line right here, kind of delineates that it, there's four doors really to get in this. So a lot of their vehicles, trailers are going to be inside overnight. So really what you're going to, the parking is really for employees during the day. Okay. Most of their stuff is going to be stored inside. Okay. And, and there's no doors going to the back of the building at all? Correct. Well, there, there's just pedestrian <coughs> access door to get out in case of emergency. But the, the overhead doors are here, then three along this side and, and three along that side. Okay. I'm all set. Okay. Mr. Chair, yeah, if, if I might, just on the question as to the parking of the, of the uh, vehicles, associated with the company. Um, as our comments have stated along throughout the process, is this is being considered a retail use. And to that end, the applicant has said they're going to park, you know, it's a, it's a landscape business that typically has, you know, trailers and trucks and all that good stuff associated with that. And, and retail use is required to be kept inside. Otherwise, um, but they also, as we just talked about, they do did receive their Zoning Board of Appeals approved for outdoor storage. So I think as we go through the specific review criteria, as we get into the next phases, um, as I said in my comments, it's important that the board really consider, you know, that the applicant be aware that, you know, all their trucks and trailers and, and commercial vehicles and materials will need to be either kept within the building or within the outdoor storage areas, that those parking spaces are for customer park employees can park there, you know, someone coming in with their individual vehicle, if they're hopping in the commercial, the commercial vehicles are what need to be maintained, whether in the buildings or in those, those outdoor storage areas. So um, just want to be sure that point is clear moving forward. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, along the lines that uh, Jay has just explained to us, I think that's probably where I'm most concerned, and I did bring it up last time around, that the orientation of the building um, as it relates to potential future development. Um, I'll, I'll back up a step. How tall is the building, uh, the, these doors, these overhead doors? <coughs> what I want to know is the dump truck get through it. Is it I don't yes. see it. Yes. It does. Yep. So that, is that 20, I mean, is it 12 feet? Yeah, I, I envision them more in the 12 foot range. Yeah, right now we operate with uh, nine foot doors where we are, and we're able to get all of our dump trucks in inside. With the nine foot door. Yeah. So yeah, because we use typically just a one ton dump truck, not anything real big. So any, so you're going to bring in your materials. They're going to actually come in through the parking field, go through your door. How how do you going to how are you going to get your materials to the storage site in the back? Is my question. So any trucks would be able to come in, and the way we've designed this is for a truck to come in, pull in this way, and then back around, dump, and then the truck would leave, the one delivering the material. And then his individual trucks would be would be in here, backed in and loaded, and they'd be able to uh, then leave. Okay. 
Is that landscaping, or am I misreading the plan? Is that landscaping in the way of them getting to your storage area? This? Yes. Th no, that's so the, the storage pond. Yeah, the gray area is the pavement. This is the grass around it that's going to be planted with some, some landscape screening. I think I'm having a problem with the scale. So the truck comes in. Just go over one more time. The truck okay. comes in, and they're going to go through your landscaping, and there's going to be a big gap. No, in the no. This, these are not parking spaces. These are no, just storage bins. Storage, storage oh, those areas. Are storage bins. Okay, yeah. thank you. All that's, right. that's where the material will be stored. I see. Okay, so the storage material will be visible for anyone using a future use in the building up on the north. It'll be screened by trees or whatever we decide to plant here, more likely arborvitae around this way. Uh, driving, if and any future development, driving yeah, north. If you're, if you're here, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to see it as you're driving by, you'll, you'll see. You would see it. And then, and then I'll, I'll back up and go right back to where I was kind of headed with this, which is if you keep an eye on the larger picture going forward, and I, you know, if, if I understood that correctly, there could be storage of vehicles in the outdoor yeah. arena down the line. I mean, you don't have to keep them. You mean if, if this is not filled with loam or, yeah. or bark mulch, could you put an outdoor vehicle in there? Right, that's what I'm asking. I, I believe that is the case, yes. Yeah, and and I think this goes back to my previous point. And I and look, your point the other night was well taken. I I understand that. I I just don't. I think in a retail, an actual retail setting, I see where you're coming from. I view this more as a a functional retail setting. I, I mean, you're you're using it on a daily basis for commercial operations, really. So I think the impact of the orientation of the building is important. Um, the way you have it for a traditional retail store, you know, your, your gaps or whatever. It's welcoming, it's inviting. I think when you're trying to get into a functional use of this, the orientation becomes more important to try to actually shield the commercial activity going on. And that would be, that would be my, that would be my, what I'm saying here tonight. That's, that's my feedback for you. I'd like to see, because down the road, if that's a hotel, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna try to screen it. You're gonna you're gonna have to do something. Um, you know you have a six floors looking down. Um, at whatever it's going to be, I just I think it could be reorientated. I think it should be reworked. That's my opinion. And good luck. I mean, I, and overall, I mean, I'm glad to see something going on here. And you're on the positive note. That's beautiful. It really is. It's a, it's a well designed, architecturally designed building. I just think the orientation and <laughs> Would like, be we, better served the other way. Yeah, are we talking about orientation of the building or the, the storage area? <laughs> but that's, like I said, that's because I, I think no matter what we do with the building, the storage area is going to be in that location because that's really the only way. No matter what shape building, no matter what the orientation, that's the only true way to get that. <coughs> but if you orientate the building a little different, I'm sure the buffering for that, probably visually for the storage area, could be um, a little bit better concealed. But that's. You guys, you guys get paid the bucks to do this. I'm just uh, giving you a little bit of feedback. That's it. Thank you. Roger, do you have yeah, something Yeah, I just ask one more question. Um, in, in the winter, do you do plowing or anything like that? So when you, uh, when you, in the off season, where are you going to have your plows? Inside the building or? Um, probably stacked inside the building. Okay. Yep. On, um, you know, shelving can hold them. Okay. Um, the the dotted area below the asphalt is that a, an anticipated future parking area if needed expansion type of thing? Yeah. Okay. So so yes, it is. So when this if this building was we follow the exact letter of the law of what could happen in here. Mm -hmm. um, actually, what we're showing here with the proposed use is not enough parking based on the current par parking code. We think it's enough because a lot of the vehicles are going to be stored inside. Those count can't count as parking spaces per the code. That's why we're saying we believe we have plenty of parking right here. If we find that we don't, we've already designed the stormwater, the infrastructure to handle an additional 12 spots down in this area. So if we find and the code enforcement says, hey, this isn't working, you have more intense use here, we have cars parking all over the place, these could be built out and you know, we wouldn't have to redesign the stormwater system because it's already being designed for it. So that, I think that's something that's, um, that we can handle at the site plan level, but that's, that's the reason for it, is that we've already thought about it and showed it and, and made that potential possible. Okay. I look forward to the site plan. Thanks. 
Um, like my fellow board members, I think um, definitely moved in a in a spot. Overall, I, I definitely appreciate the receptiveness and the responsiveness to the curb cut comment that you're consolidating that. Um, I happen to like the building orientation the way it is, um, and I, I can understand where Mr. McGee is coming from. I think you know, people could definitely have an honest difference of opinion about that. I think that's what we have. Um, I, I think um, I'm hearing that otherwise folks on the board seem to like the orientation of the building the way it is. If I, if I heard things correctly, I'm looking around. I think that that's the general sort of majority consensus. Um, I think the architecture looks great. I like what you've done with the with that overhead door. Um, you know, to me, in terms of the orientation and the function of the building, um, there's good, there's not really going to be a perfect solution given given the nature of the of the of the business and the function of the building. Uh, it just seems to me that however you rotate things or orient things, there's always going to be the possibility that someone may see something that doesn't look. Uh, pristine, but um, I think that's you know, as we get into site plan review, we'll be talking about buffering and, and other things. Um, getting back to the master plan focused discussion, one thing I didn't hear anyone talk about explicitly, although you know Nick Nick's comments got to it a little bit, is any concern about the location or configuration of the back buildings, and that's something that if we if we grant master plan approval tonight, we're sort of setting that in stone, so to speak. So I, I want to make sure that no one has any threshold concerns about that. Susan? Well, now that you bring it up, is this going to actually be in concrete? I mean, if, they, if, if we okay this and then somebody comes along and would like to use the second lot, but they don't really like the way it's laid out. The chances of coming back here or to the CBA and having that change is like not going to happen. I mean, that's why we're doing this, right? You can always amend a master plan, just like a site plan. You could come in, but, but what I would say is if someone came in and liked the orientation of any of these buildings, they could go forward and do it. Right. Because the master plan establishes the right. general layout. But it um, is possible. I mean, it's, general it's, it's like, it's the like general any, patient. Right. But if someone comes in and, and, yeah, 10 years down the road, I know the applicant has said he doesn't have intentions of building out, but down the road if someone does and they don't like the way the master plan is, they could come back to this board and say, well, I want to Okay. I just wanted to make plan. sure that that flexibility existed, yep. that this yep. is not something that is absolutely never going to be open to change. Chances are pretty good it won't be, and we have to keep that in mind, but we're also not cementing this in place. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Did you have anything else, Nick? Of course. Uh, <laughs> 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 Are we going to go back there again? Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's the corner that with the parking field. It's uh, the way it's laid out now. I, I would worry that you have parking spots possibly backing out into a roadway. Um, and then additionally, again, preference. Uh, why not bring the building a little bit closer to the actual roadway and leave the park in the uh, bulk of the parking field to the back? Again, a preference thing, but I definitely would worry about that corner. Where okay. okay. Uh, are you? Right nope. Here. Not even there. On the proposed future stuff, there. Keep going down the road. Oh. Yeah, in there. That's that would okay. be my. So, so, from our thinking, all yeah. this stuff, it's, it's future. It's hypothetical. Of course. And. No matter what happens, we have to come back to the board for no matter what happens here, whether it's a site plan approval mm -hmm. or if we're going to amend. And nine times out of ten, I make it 99 out of 100. I've never seen a perfectly square building, you know, unless you're <laughs> 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 Fair enough. But that would be, an, uh, just so you know, uh, I, would, I would rather see. Yeah. A, All right. We're with you. You get it. All right. Okay. Thanks. So unless there's any... Further discussion on this. Uh, we've clearly got some things to, for you to look at and think about and work on for site plan review, and there are things that I know that we'll be looking at and more questions we'll be asking. Um, but for now, I think we can uh, look at granting master plan approval, and I will move 
Can I just offer, before you make a motion, so we don't have to get you, into the whole amendment bit. Sure. Um, <laughs> the applicant has talked about, and it sounds like the board is generally amenable to uh, re or, uh, reducing one of the curb cuts. So as your discussion, maybe you make a condition that a revised master plan be submitted for town planners <coughs> review and approval for clarity of record. So when they do come back in, the master plan depicts the board's expectations. <coughs> that this isn't the plan on record. Just something right. to think about. So <laughs> all right. That's why we have you here. <laughs> what he said. What did he just say? Um, I will move that the board grant master plan approval on the condition that the applicant come back with a revised master plan reflecting that curb cut revision and that it be uh, suitable then for their approval. Second. All in favor? Shall it be unanimous? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Leighton Farm LLC requests amended subdivision review for expansion of previously approved Leighton Farm subdivision, assessor's map R57, lot 1B and 3A. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see, it's an application that was before the board uh, a couple of meetings ago. This is for a conservation subdivision for a parcel located in the R2, Residential 2 District, uh, with a good portion of the parcel also in the Resource Protection District. Um, so to that end, the applicant has gone through our conservation <coughs> subdivision design standards in their review process. Phase one of this project was approved about a year ago or so with the first 23 lots of the subdivision with the remaining 60-odd acres uh, that was well identified by the board and through the review process for future development. Um, this application has been through many iterations and staff review comments and peer review comments and board reviews. At this time, staff is pretty confident and comfortable with, the, um, with where the plan sets at. We do have some minor revisions to the plan sets, but um, nothing that would ultimately change the design in terms of our review criteria. So. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I haven't seen this one a number of times, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and staff has prepared a draft motion for the board to consider tonight if you're so inclined. Thank you, Jay. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with uh, Sebago Technics of South Portland. Uh, with me tonight is Vincent Maeta uh, of uh, Leighton Farm, LLC. Uh, as Jay said, number one, I, I certainly want to thank Jay for all of his time. He spent uh, quite a few meetings with me going over the plans uh, to get them to the point where they are, and I certainly appreciate his, uh, his efforts on our behalf. Uh, just to go over a few of the major changes that we made, uh, number one, we clarified the area around the tower itself, so all that property is basically shown to be retained by the owner. Uh, the only thing that we're proposing is the proposed uh, right-of-way for Leighton Farm Road, which will come down through here, which allows our two means of egress. Um, and in terms of association with this, with the full understanding that once the, uh, the tower gets worked out, uh, we'll be back in front of the board to kind of finalize that whole issue. Uh, one of the main points that uh, staff had also come up with was uh, the actual easements, uh, that we actually had uh, the three main detention and treatment basins uh, located on what was proposed to be conveyed to the town of Scarborough. And uh, they much with, with easements back to the homeowners association. Uh, they must prefer the fact that uh, these areas be retained by the homeowners association uh, rather than conveyed to the town. So those areas have actually been taken back out of the uh, the open space calculations that are required for the 50 percent. Uh, the green that you see here uh, is the full area that's going to be conveyed uh, to the town of Scarborough, and uh, the net residential areas uh, were. Uh, revised accordingly and again meet the 50% thresholds. It was this, as you may recall, there's actually a couple of small pieces on the other side of the river as well. Um, part of the issues, uh, part of the discussion we had with the planning board last time also had been uh, the construction of a sidewalk uh, connecting the two roadways. Uh, we did include that on the latest plan. 
Uh, the other part was the uh, construction of the sidewalk from uh, First Avenue up to the intersection on Route 1. Again, I didn't have any specific engineering drawings on that, but we did provide a, uh, uh, an aerial, if you will, showing the proposed location, and uh, uh, we have received comments back, and certainly one of the conditions as we read it uh, was um, uh, prior to Phase 4 that we get the construction drawings associated with that, and we're very comfortable with that. Uh, the other part was just in terms of the actual parking areas. As you may recall, this is phase one, which is currently under construction. Uh, we are going to propose what had been a temporary turnaround, uh, that this will actually be a small parking area for five spaces, uh, which will be part of the conveyance of the town. A second one will be located down in this area here. Uh, again, the, the actual trail will be extended uh, to access the sidewalks uh, to allow access from these small parking areas uh, for people that want to get out and actually walk and connect back to the trail system. Uh, that's within the uh, maintained open space, uh, which connects to uh, other existing town-owned property. Uh, again, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we know that the board's seen this numerous times. Uh, uh, we'd certainly be happy to answer any questions, but aside from that, I think I would conclude my presentation and again be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> we'll start with Roger this time. Thank you. Um, if I recall, the last time you were here, there was an issue came up with the Grubers, the neighbors. Uh, uh, yes, and, I, I, and again, we just had a general conversation, if you will, after I left here. Uh, and again, maybe I can just... <coughs> assuming this is back on. The actual right-of-way has been cut up through here. Uh, their proposed issues, they thought that there had been some change to the drainage, uh, I believe. And again, I don't certainly want to speak for anybody, uh, but I think the main thing was just that obviously those trees have been cut in, in the area that's in there. Obviously, once we build that road, uh, you know, the, the underdrain that's associated with it, the storm drain that's associated with it, uh, all of the runoff that's associated with this will actually be picked up and taken away so that there certainly shouldn't be any new drainage issues associated with their problem. <coughs> and again, I just had a general conversation with them after that last meeting. Okay. Uh, so, Jay, as far as we're aware, the Grubas are satisfied with the way this is proceeding? I haven't had any further discussions with okay. those folks. I'm all set, then. Yeah, thank you. Susan? Um, just want to double-check that the... Um, Letter, the memorandum from um, Woodward and Curran about the uh, depicting the sidewalk along the north edge of Elmwood Avenue and the concept plan of the sidewalk on First Avenue. Are you familiar with what this Absolutely, is? Absolutely, yes. And again, those are specifically parts yeah. of the conditions of approval, okay. Susan, associated with that. So I just want to make sure. Um, we have been around this. We Many must. Times. We certainly have. I almost feel like I've walked the whole thing with you. Um, I don't have any problems at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mike? Um, nothing to add. I appreciate the uh, inclusion of the sidewalk, certainly, mm -hmm. and uh, cleaning up that area that you're labeling to be retained by the owner. I think that, that uh, created some conversation last time, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate that. And we did specifically, you may recall, um, create the fact that we will have a four-way intersection. Uh, right here, and I know, again, I submitted a specific plan associated with that, and, and uh, the, the, the city's uh, town's traffic engineer had a couple of minor modifications requested. Again, that is part of the conditions of approval, and certainly uh, that will be, though, at the end of the day, once that road is constructed, a four-way uh, full four -way, uh, stop intersection. Okay, great. So, uh, nothing to add. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Jay, and yes, John for you, working Jay. so hard on this and coming back so quickly with it. John? We're good. Okay. Good when we all work together, it works out. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah, I just want to re uh, also reinforce uh, uh, thanks for the sidewalk. Uh, you know, the applicant didn't give us any problems as some applicants have, and and it, it will be an additional, you know, a welcome addition to that area as far as the sidewalks are concerned. And since I was under the false impression that we had already voted for all of this, <laughs> I'm still happy. Thanks. Uh, we only did phase but one. I'm glad we're catching up with you. We only did phase one. I know. Good. Uh, thank you. Um, well, and I also always appreciate a good sidewalk, so I thank you for that and uh, for all the other 
work to, to get to this point. And I'll also pile on and thank staff as well. Um, and uh, I really don't think I have anything else to add. So I will uh, put a motion forward. I'm good too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew was, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I don't want to take that for granted. No, right. That's what I get for trying to be creative about how I jump around good. on the board. Right. You didn't want a long comment. No. no. You already used up all your I did use up my, uh, my minutes. No, the time's on the right. level. I'm sorry. He's the most thankful right. man in the room right now. All right. <laughs> all right. Now I do move to approve the application of Layton Farm LLC under provisions of the Town of Scarborough Zoning and Subdivision Ordinances for the amended subdivision plan to Layton Farm Subdivision, phases two through five, with the findings as presented in writing and the following waivers and conditions. <coughs> Waiver number one, permit Dillon Drive and Wynn Way to be constructed at a width of 22 feet rather than the town standard 24 feet. Number two, in lieu of the recreation contribution fee, the board accepts the off-site pedestrian improvements provided on Elmwood Avenue, as well as the improvements along Green Acres Lane between First Avenue and Route 1. And the following conditions. Number one, the subdivision shall be constructed in accordance with the subdivision plans titled First Amended Overall Subdivision Plan of Layton Farm Subdivision as prepared by Sebago Technics dated June 8, 2015. The plan set is to be revised in accordance with the comments raised by planning staff, Traffic Solutions, and Wood Woodard and Curran. The revised plan set to be reviewed and approved by planning staff prior to the board signing the plans. Number two, prior to the release of the attested final subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the applicant shall execute and record all documentation necessary to comply with the town's post-construction stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance. Number three, prior to the start of construction for each phase of development, the no disturbed setback area shall be clearly delineated in coordination with town staff. Number four, the traffic impact fee assessments for phases two through five shall be paid prior to the start of each phase. The fee shall be paid proportionally based on the number of residential lots in each phase. Number five, Prior to the start of phase four, the applicant shall provide final construction plans for the pedestrian improvements along Green Acres Lane, Green Acres Avenue, for review and approval by the town engineer. The improvements shall be completed as part of the phase four development. In the final condition, prior to the start of phase five, the developer will be required to pay a sum of $2,500 for future traffic signal timing improvements to the Route 1 Green Acres Lane intersection. Second. Second, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? To be unanimous, thank you. Thank you very Welcome. much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Item number eight on our agenda. Avesta Housing requests site plan review for Southgate House, 577 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U34, Lot 37. Jay? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's see, the applicants before the board with a proposal to redevelop the Southgate House uh, property, which is, as you just mentioned, located at 577 Route 1, with a 50 affordable housing units. Uh, the proposal uh, calls for uh, eight units within the refurbished Southgate House proper and 42 units within the newly constructed multiplex building. Um, as board members will recall, this item is sub or due to the scale and scope of the proposal, the applicant is going through a contract zone process with our town council. Um, and so this is yet another step in that process. The council it gave, had an initial review and moved it along in the process. So the next step is for this board to conduct a preliminary site plan and subdivision review. Um, I say site plan and subdivision, but really it's ultimately uh, the site plan review criteria going to be the, the prevailing criteria that we use in reviewing the application to subdivision sort of in name only and the, the creating uh, the number of units. Um, again, it's really the site plan provisions that will 
mostly apply. Um, Ford did conduct a sketch plan back on June 1st, and they're before the board now to begin that formal review process to get to a preliminary approval. Should and when the board gets to a preliminary approval, the applicant would then go back to the town council to uh, uh, finalize the contract zone. Should the co council ultimately approve the contract zone, the applicant would then return back to this board for a final review. Um, so to that end, staff, we've provided our normal comments under site plan review uh, criteria. Some of them are, you know, sort of details that, you know, uh, unless board members want, want to sort of delve into, we certainly can. But I think in terms of a preliminary review, the two sort of critical items that staff flagged and identified <coughs> really revolve around access to the site and parking. Um, one of the things that we identified early on in the process and working with our, our, our peer-reviewed traffic engineer, Bill Bray from Traffic Solutions, is the need to really understand left-hand turns into and out of the site and how those will function. Um, and so that information we're still sort of waiting on to see uh, what, that, what that analysis comes up with. The other item, and we began, we began talking about this a little bit during sketch plan, is the applicant is seeking uh, a relief from the town's typical uh, parking standards. Um, the applicant had uh, inadvertently miscalculated the number of parking spaces. Um, as staff identifies, the site would require 78 parking spaces. They're requesting to build 54 spaces. So regardless of the parking number, um, staff still believes the conversation really winds up at the same place. The applicant's asking for 54 spaces, and as we had previously noted, um, the applicant should provide the board some type of evidence, whether it's from other locations that they occupy or, or what have you, uh, that, that would cert, uh, satisfy the needs of the site, sort of regardless of what the town standards are. But um, So with that, those are really the two, we believe, pressing issues to getting towards preliminary. Um, obviously, there are other uh, more uh, specific design elements that we can work our way through. But um, at this point, I think I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I will turn over to the applicant's representative. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Dan Riley. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics, and we're the civil engineer, surveyor, and landscape architect for the project. And with us tonight is Kyle Ambler, project manager from Vesta Housing, as well as Rick Caduti and uh, Maggie Stanley uh, from Caduti Thomas Architects, um, who can answer any questions about the building or some of the historical uh, review that we talked about uh, at the sketch plan meeting. Um, as Jay mentioned, uh, we were last before you for a sketch plan hearing in early June. Uh, we prepared our site plan application and we are requesting a preliminary approval so we can move uh, forward with the contract zone provisions of the project. Um, obviously that has to run through and come back to you with a, uh, for a final site plan approval, but some of those provisions are pretty critical in the, in the process and we're uh, happy to answer any questions you have to try to make you comfortable with the project as it stands now. Um, we did receive the staff's um, review comments. Um, I'm glad to answer any of those in detail, but I thought I would really get to some of the changes that we made to the plan or in the response to some of those items that, uh, that Jay brought up. <coughs> uh, the first item we talked about uh, at the last meeting is the parking requirements. Um, as we stated um, in our application, uh, we are currently proposing in our contract zone provision uh, to allow the site to be constructed with 55 total parking spaces. Uh, that's based on uh, one space per unit within the 50-unit building <coughs> with five uh, potential visitor <coughs> parking spaces. The other way to look at that would be one space per unit uh, for the efficiency units and the one-bedroom units and then two spaces per unit for the two-bedroom units. Um, when we were last before you, we were a little bit short on space from that design. Um, what we've done, I'll step over and talk a little bit about the specific revisions that we made in parking to get us to where we think we can, we can achieve 55 parking spaces on the site. Revisions we made were we've added two parking spaces here adjacent to the site entrance. We still remain outside of the setback that's required by the ordinance for parking um, adjacent to the right of way. We remain at least 25 feet from the, uh, any of these parking stalls to travel where we want. So we added two parking spaces <coughs> here. We also picked up parking spaces in this bank of parking here that's located in the shoreland zone. If you recall, the rear of the site is located in the shoreland zone. By reducing eight parking spaces here from nine feet to eight feet width, that picked up one additional space. So we added three. 
So right now in the plan, the drawings that are in the application, there are 54 states to show. We have two options we talked about with some uh, input from the board that we can get to the 55 parking spaces. One, we can expand the parking bank here where our handicap space is located to pick up an additional space. It's not our preferred alternative because we think the plaza entrance and accessibility of the building uh, is better served by not having parking there. The other option is to convert these nine foot wide parking stalls also located in the shoreland zone to eight feet wide, which would net us another parking space in the <coughs> footprint in the shoreland zone. So with those two options, we would meet the 55 parking spaces that were proposed. Can I jump ahead? Just so that we can save some time here. You're talking 55 spaces for occupants of the building, right? What happens if there are visitors or maintenance people? Where are all those people going to park? Well, the uh, parking spaces, I have some information about the parking demand that Avesta has developed from similar projects in Cumberland County, it's not in their application. It's material we, we developed in response to the staff review comments we submitted to staff, but they didn't have an opportunity yet to review that before it came before you. Um, I have to summarize here. Essentially, uh, Avesta looked at six affordable housing developments in Cumberland County that are similar in size and scope to this project. Uh, they include three projects in Portland, two in Westbrook, and one in Bridgeton. Avesta's parking is all managed by permits. So residents that in the building receive a parking permit, those were people that are allowed to park in the parking lot. So we have an accurate number, the actual number of vehicles that are currently being used at, at any of their developments at any time. What we found as we looked at that is we, we looked at each project, each project, the total number of vehicle permits that those projects currently have, um, as well as the total number of units and the number of bedrooms based on the, the unit mix in the development. What we found from that was that the actual parking ratios in their projects average out to about 0.6 vehicles per unit. Our proposal with 55 spaces would be 1.1 vehicles per unit. So that's almost twice as much as what they, their experience showed as requirement on their project. When you look at that in terms of bedrooms, most of the, the six projects that looked like looked at are a little more heavily weighted towards two and three bedroom units, whereas this project more heavily weighted towards efficiency in one bedroom units. The average of those six projects was about 0.3 vehicles per bedroom for over, averaged out over the project. Our proposal is for one vehicle per bedroom for this development. So the, the total number of parking spaces would be for all uses on the site, would be controlled by building permits for the occupants, I mean, excuse me, parking permits for the occupants. And based on the, the Similar projects that Avesta has developed here in Cumberland County, they feel that that's sufficient. Um, we've done some research. Um, there's not a lot of research out there on the, the requirements of affordable house, parking demand for affordable housing. There have been some studies done uh, in California and the city of San Diego. Uh, I believe a, a similar study determined parking demand for affordable housing, as has San Francisco and a few other communities in the West Coast. The results of that are very similar, that it's about 0.6 vehicles per unit is about the average in those studies for affordable housing. The logic or the, the, the more obvious reasons for that simply are that uh, populations of lower income own fewer cars, and they, the population that occupies some of these affordable housing projects tend to drive less due to disabilities and other reasons. And so we, we looked at that research from the Bessler Project, from some studies nationally, and that's what we're basing our, our proposal on. That but to answer your question, it would be total spaces for all uses and needs of the project. I have some further comment, but I'll wait until we do this. <laughs> uh, we did, uh, as the board discussed, um, one of the items that was a, a topic of discussion at the last meeting was the potential to add parking spaces across the front of the building. Um, it's a design criteria, or it's a design that's identifying the ordinance as an option in this zone when buildings are set back some distance from the property line. Um, I haven't shown this on the plan. The net effect of that, um, after you add the one bank of parking that would be allowed and you'd be able to fit on this property, um, after adding those spaces and then what you would lose to provide access to them, you would net out six or maybe seven spaces total, um, additional spaces 
by parking across from the building. Um, that's something that Vesta wishes to pursue. Um, we think it's important to maintain the, the visual character of that property, both from an aesthetic standpoint from Route 1, but also as part of the historic preservation criteria that ultimately the project will have to go through um, as it gets further in the process. The other item uh, of discussion regarding access had to do with uh, fire protection and fire lanes. We have met with the fire department, the project architect met with the fire department. What you see on your site plan is, is shown is we've widened the, the, the sidewalk that we showed in the sketch plan review to 12 foot width to allow fire access from room one along the west side of the property up to the barn that is planned to be preserved on the site. Um, the uh, architect has met with the, the fire department who uh, we understand is satisfied that that provides them adequate access to their ladder trucks and access on some roof that they would need to access. Uh, in the staff comments, uh, it was brought up the desire to potentially reduce the pavement <coughs> that and use some other pavement system that would support a vehicle that might be vegetated, and that's certainly something we can do uh, as part of the final assessment of the issue. The other item um, does regard the, the traffic uh, aspect, particularly the left turns to the site that we mentioned. Uh, it was raised by the traffic peer review engineer. We have revised the traffic study to address his comments. I don't know if his comments are in the package. Um, in one of those comments was that a, the, the, the peer review engineer asked us to use the DOT methodology to, to determine if a left turn lane warrant was met for terms of the project. The DOT, uh, the main DOT manual, doesn't have a specific um, criteria to evaluate left turn warrants when you have four lanes of traffic to each direction. The criteria in the DOT, in the main DOT manual, addresses one lane in each direction. So, in researching that, we reviewed a different national methodology that's incorporated um, that does address the two lanes in each direction. It's the basis of the DOT process for one lane, same process, but it's a different methodology because the DOT has a formal copy. The left turn lane warrant is met for the afternoon rush hour. It's not meant for the morning rush hour, but it's meant for the afternoon rush hour. To give some context as to what that means, it's primarily due to the volume of traffic that we have to oppose. When we counted traffic, there's about 1,800 vehicles in the peak hour in the afternoon heading southbound. That vehicles need to turn across. Um, our trip generation, based on the new development, without taking any credit for existing trips or any reduction in the trips that you might see due to the smaller vehicle ownership, indicate in that hour we would have eight vehicles trying to make a left turn across that traffic in a period of an hour. From a point uh, to understand what the, what the term work means, when we looked at that using that methodology, any development in this quarter of the roadway that has two left-hand turns meets the warrant for a left turn lane. There currently aren't any left turn lanes in this section of the roadway. Um, so we recognize that that's an issue that needs to be vetted out um, with the traffic engineer with the town. We think there's a number of options that we can discuss with them in terms of how we control access from our site so it doesn't impact the, the, the traveling roadway. Um, we obviously need some time to do that. It involves DOT, it involves the town's traffic engineer and the town's designers for the section of the roadway. Um, we are asking that we, we incorporate that as part of the final site plan approval. Um, we understand that this is, you know, that the planning board has for due responsibility here at the preliminary, but also the final. Um, but a lot of the decisions that can be made in the contract zone process will have bearing on what we ultimately do for this issue. So uh, we want to address it fully with you. Um, we are asking that you consider um, helping us move along into the contract zone process so we can finalize the density of the project, finalize the number of parking that would be necessary and required, and then address some of these uh, some of these issues. Um, through your, your final site plan. Um, with that, um, I think those are the major issues. If you must have missed something, I'd be glad to answer any questions about the other review comments or other revisions to be on the panel. But I want to get to your comments. Thank you. First, I'd like to offer the opportunity for any public comment. Come on up and introduce yourself in five minutes or less, please. Sure. Uh, my name is David Darling, and I own property across the street at 582 Route 1 at the four-way intersection of Payne Road and Route 1. And uh, if, if I understand correctly, 
When you say a left-hand turning lane, do you mean in the middle of Route 1? Just is that what you mean? You okay. need to address questions to... Oh, sorry, sorry. Is that what he sorry. means? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what about people that want to left out of the site? Um, we don't know yet. We don't know yet, and that's one of that, that's, 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 that's my part question. of the unknown right now. That's my question. Um, yeah. That's part of the unknown right now. <coughs> we can, the board can certainly pursue that with the applicant going forward, both tonight and and beyond. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Nick, would you like? To <laughs> Playing nice. All right. Um, I get a quick question, and you're just going to have to refresh me on this one because did your building move? Is that second storage building move? Because I see them connected in the picture here, the two storage buildings connected, and I see a significant gap between them now. I'm, 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 I'm right here. Yeah, between that one and that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of the site plan application. In in the, the development program for the pro the the two existing barns are connected. Um, but you're going to take stuff out. That's right, they're, they're connected by a by a stairway that was built sometime after the original construction. Um, this building, which the plan is to incorporate into the building program for the new structure, needs to be supported, supported on a new foundation. So when that occurs, our plan is to raise it, construct a new uh, foundation underneath it, but move it uh, about 10 feet to the um, towards the roadway. That, okay, so it is going to get moved. Yes, that's right. okay. Thank you for refreshing me. I just um, picked up on it now. The other, and I wanted to say thank you, by the way, for the um, parking ratio. I know we had requested that, and that's that's very helpful for to help us put it into context what we're looking at. And then my uh, my other comment here is, you know, everything is about this left turn in my mind. Um, any, in my opinion, any delay in traffic flowing southbound, northbound taking that left across has a huge potential to cause a jam up into Dunstan, even up the broad turn. I, I mean, if you're talking trying to cross traffic against the grain of 1,800 cars, a 10, 15, 20 second delay in turning with one of your lanes stacked back up 20 seconds long has the potential to really cause serious issues in a, in a highly you know, problematic area for us anyway. So I'm very interested to see how we try to come to some sort of solution as regards to traffic. That is that is my major, major, major concern on this project, seeing what I've seen here. And it, it's all related to traffic. Like, again, I appreciate the parking ratio. It makes, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable about what I'm seeing with your parking layout. But that's about it for, for me. Thanks. Roger? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, Three points. Um, I agree with Nick regarding the left-hand turn, and actually I think that's probably going to be an issue that the town's going to have to deal with on Route 1, because I'm not sure what Estabrook's situation is right now, whether they're still in existence or not, but I don't think they are, and I think part of the problem was, especially in the summertime, trying to get people into that into that facility, you know? Uh, so that's a real, that's a real problem. Um, and uh, I think I suspect the town, like I said, is going to have to deal with it at some point in the future. But in the meantime, though, it seems to me, assuming nothing happens with Route 1 at, at the moment, the vegetation, the trees you have at the entrance, do you have like a tree or a bush or something coming when you're entering, coming in right there at the corner? Yes, we have some plantings at the corner. I, I, would, I, would, I would think that it has to be very, very low because cars heading south coming in, especially where you have parking, like Nick mentioned last time, you have parking right there almost by the entrance. People have to be able to see what's happening. Um, so I would say that's got to be very low vegetation, whatever it is. Okay. Yeah, certainly any plantings we do has to respect sight lines, no question. Then, then going into the parking, the, just the regular parking situation, um, I understand what you're saying. But a lot of your low-income housing or affordable housing is in area, is in locations where there's public transportation. As far as I know, we don't have any in Scarborough, right? <laughs> and, uh, but it's very limited. 
I mean, it's not li it's not, not like, for instance, in Portland on the peninsula or something, something like that. So I, I'm a little concerned about that. You know, your ratios that you have there, because I just, I was hoping you might have some examples of. Uh, didn't didn't you folks say you had a place down in uh, Saco also, a facility in Saco or some, in in a suburban area? We, we do have a, a property and... Just briefly introduce yourself for oh, the record. Kyle Lambler, I'm the development officer for this project for Avesta. Um, we do have a project in Saco. Um, Golden Park Maple is actually just rehabbed through the 9% tax credit program. Um, the, the population there is a little bit different. It's, it's either elderly or disabled. It's much lower income. I don't know offhand exactly the parking usage there. Um, I do know that most of the times when I, I go out there for site visits and things, it, it does seem to be about 60% in use, and that's combined with um, the contractors parking in the parking lot as well. So it tends to be to be pretty low. So okay. At least um, for, okay. for that particular one. Well, I understand that rationale, but I, I, I don't know. I just I just wonder about that being located where it is, you know, Southgate, um, and the lack of, you know, regular public transportation where I, I suspect a lot of your your residents would would avail themselves of. So mm -hmm. that's a concern. I, I you know, right. So yeah, there is a stop for I believe the the Zoom shuttle bus. Yeah, down I, don't, I don't know how long that there. goes by yeah. and. It's getting better. Is it? Oh, yeah. But does it's it stop in Scarborough? Oh yeah. It's fairly it's frequent. Yeah, I have friends there. Susan, Susan, does it stop in that area though, where the where the building is? It stops. stops. Yes, it does. I think that this discussion, if I may, this discussion yeah. is something that is in flux. What's happening with public transportation is very much in flux right now. So you know, if we want to get into talking about it in terms of the site plan approval, fine. But you're not going to find anything out there right now that's going to yeah. that's going Thank to be you. firm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All set? I'm all set. Thank you. Sure up enough. <laughs> Susan? Um, I know we're focusing on parking and traffic and as well we should be. I just want to make sure that we all know there are lots of other things in here that are not um, completed yet. I don't think we need to take our time this evening to go at them, but just to make sure that yes, you know that we know that everybody knows, that's right? Um, parking doesn't bother me too much. Um, first of all, I don't think there are going to be that many cars. The area is becoming more and more walkable. It's becoming easier. There are more places that you're going to be able to walk to. Things are happening in um, happening rather rapidly, actually. We knew it was going to happen, but it's happening very rapidly right now in Dunstan. So the parking part and getting around and getting what you need doesn't bother me too much. Traffic, however, I know I say this a lot, but I'll say it again. I've been here forever. I was on the planning board when Dunkin' Donuts wanted to go in. I am intimately connected to this to this part of the traffic in Scarborough. When I was coming, when, I, when we were doing the, the Dunkin' Donuts thing, I came south on Route 1 across the marsh, keeping speed with the cars in front of me. And when I came up to the crest, cars were going 50 miles an hour. Excuse me. That is not a joke. 50 miles an hour. Now, things are a little better now because of the traffic improvements that have been added, but it's not a place where this is going to be entering where people are going to be going 20 and 25 miles an hour. They're just not going to do it. So something has to be done. I don't have any idea what you're going to do. I have no clue. But the way it's, I, I just know that once people leave Dunstan heading north, they're ready to hit 50 and go across the marsh. And when they come this way, going when they come on Route 1 going um, south, they're coming off 50 miles an hour. And I love this process. I love this program. I think the Southgate House is perfect for this. I love everything about it. But I don't have anything positive to say about what you can do about traffic. But that's why they pay you the big bucks, because they're going to be able to figure out how to do that. And I hope the traffic doesn't put a stymie on this, because I think it's important that we have it here in Scarborough. Anything we can do to support you 
but I just anticipate this is going to be where the rubber hit the road and no pun is intended. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ron? Yeah, I just want to pick up on, it, on the same theme. I'm still not totally convinced about the parking situation, but making an assumption based on your statistics, I still would want a reassurance, and I heard Susan say that the public transportation is in flux, that there would definitely be public transportation that would stop there or near there uh, for the project to go forward in my mind, uh, because I'll go along with what you said as far as the number needed and, and how many people may or may not own a vehicle. Okay, but for those people who want to do something there's got to be public transportation. Can I, I can address that. There, there is a stop for the commuter bus about 1,000 feet south of this project at Dunstan Corner. That access to public transportation is one of the criteria that Avesta has to use in the ranking of these projects as it goes through the main housing process. So there is public transportation. It <coughs> could possibly be expanded. We have to explore that. Um, but there is public transportation in the Dunstan, Dunstan Corner area of about 1,000 feet south of the project. I don't know specifically where it is, but that's based on the published map from, that's in the contract zone application that we submitted back in hey, June. Let me follow up on that. Is there a, uh, an overhead for people to stand during bad weather? And could that be added to your project? Yeah, I don't see why a, a bus shelter couldn't be added, certainly. I, I don't know the conditions of that specific stop. I know generally where it's located based on the map. Because, uh, again, I'd rather not see people during the winter or rainy to, to mm -hmm. at least have some overhead for them to, to wait for the public transportation. If that, I, I'm happy with that. Sir, yeah, it's an important consideration for the owner. It's, it's yeah. the reason we, part of the reason they selected the site. As far as the traffic, I, I mean, uh, Coming out, I, I would have no left turn at all because the lights are right there. So people can come out, take a light, go up to the lights, and come back if they had to. Going in, that's, that's another story altogether. And I agree with Susan. I mean, I go down that road all the time, and they're not going 20, 25 miles an hour. And I, uh, you know, I, again, I don't want this to be a, a, a project stop either, but uh, I think all of us. Uh, on this committee uh, have some concerns about the left <coughs> turn into the place. Sure. Left turn out is easy. You make them take a right turn out. But left turn in. And uh, I also agree with Susan. There are other issues. We're focusing on these two big ones. But uh, uh, we should not lose sight of some of the other issues. And I won't bore you with those right now because I'm sure you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chair. If, if you don't mind, I can address, maybe maybe elaborate a little bit on the on the traffic. I tried to be brief, so, excuse me, so I can get to the, the questions you had. Um, we, we're not underestimating the, the issue by any means. Um, there are just that there are a number of ways that we may be able to address it. Um, some of them may be a town policy type decision about, as Susan mentioned, you know, or I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Beely mentioned, mentioned that this may, this turn lane may be an issue, a larger issue that the, the town needs to address for a longer stretch of Route 1. So there's potential of a, a left turn, shared left turn lane in front of the site. Um, there are options related to controlling access on our side of the property with a divider island. So perhaps our project is only a right turn in and a right turn out. Um, there are certainly still difficulties with those movements, but it minimizes the impact on the adjacent roadway. Uh, there could be options of extending the median as it is today to prevent left-hand turns coming out, but that could potentially impact businesses across the street. Um, so there's a range of options that I think we can explore. Um, like I said, we did do the analysis that the town traffic engineer requested. Um, he's out of, uh, unavailable for a few days, so we, need to, we really need to sit down with him, I think make sure he's in agreement with our analysis, and then look at some of these options. Um, but there are a range of options that we can certainly look at. We don't mean to minimize um, the importance of that issue or, or your concern with it. Um, the, the left turns and right turns out of the project are difficult, and it's stated in the traffic report um, that there are delays there. Uh, those would only affect the residents of this project who would be aware of that when they moved in. Uh, but certainly the left turns coming off have a potential to impact the roadway, and, uh, and we're certainly ready to, to work through that process. Um, as I said, we're, we, we recognize that we're trying to move this along quickly. We recognize the board has, has a thorough review to do on this. Um, but some of the larger questions of the contract zone kind of need to be resolved before we can, we can really come to a final solution on some of these other items. 
Anything else? Yeah. Thank you. John? I'm all set with this as far as moving it forward to the council for the contract zone. It's going to come back to us, and there's some issues that we've obviously brought up we're very, very concerned about uh, that we can deal with at that next step. The traffic studies were done, just to make one more point on traffic, were done now. They weren't done in July. So it's even going to be worse in July. So we really need to take a hard look at that with staff and come up with some great ideas. You know, we like the project, but it's a problem. And if you move in there, I'll, I'll agree, you know, you know the situation. You might have to go around the block to get home. So <laughs> I'm done with that. It's good. Let's move it forward. Thanks, John. Mike? Uh, we're looking for, you're looking for preliminary site plan approval tonight? That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to see this move forward also because there's, there's a whole lot to like. Uh, there certainly are some concerns. Everyone's spoken to it, so I can't add to it. I agree with Sue. Uh, I remember, uh, like we just did the Dunkin' Donuts effort, um, there was a lot of challenges right there <coughs> on Route 1. Um, I'm hoping you can overcome them one way or the other. There's various ways, like you just suggested. I'm happy with the parking uh, scenario. I, I am looking forward to seeing that written report you said resides at the uh, Planning Board Department. I'm sorry, which report? The Planning Board Department has your parking analysis. Is that true, Jay? Or, we received that by email this afternoon. Yes. I haven't seen it. All right, yeah, but you have it, and we're going to get that soon, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Is that we're going to see that. As well as, uh, yes. as well as the left turn. <laughs> no, you can't we see just, it. I do better than to come and try and hand it to you today. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> as long as somebody sees it. Um, but um, I really like this project. I've said it right from day one. And uh, you certainly have a lot of challenges, but uh, um, I'm confident that you'll be able to overcome them. Look forward to you coming back. So I'm in favor of preliminary site plan approval tonight. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm also a supporter of this project. and. Um, I think I'm hearing generally that folks are obviously concerned about the traffic and the left turn movements. Um, that the applicant clearly understands that that's a big X factor and that um, we do grant preliminary approval tonight. We're moving forward sort of at your risk, so to speak, with the full understanding that um, that's still a major issue that's out there um, that this board will need to get comfortable with before potentially granting final approval. Um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the traffic and the, and the, and the turning, um, I share a lot of Susan's concerns. I had the same experience on the, the Dunkin' Donuts proposal. Um, this one's a little bit further up over the crust of the hill. Um, there's some, maybe some, there's a little more room for workable solutions than there was there, I think, or at least I hope. Um, but I still generally agree that um, that's a, a real issue, and traffic flies along there, and I won't belabor that much more. But I also will agree with uh, Mr. McGee that the, the waiting to make a left turn going <coughs> down is another potential issue because those lights, even with the improvements, we're getting into that time of year where those where traffic is backed up through multiple light cycles there already. So you, you know the, the challenge ahead of you there, and we look forward to seeing some of those potential solutions. Um, I'm okay on parking. Um, I understand some of the concerns that were raised. Um, I know from my own sort of anecdotal experience um, with this type of housing generally in a variety of settings, including some more purely suburban settings, um, that even in those scenarios that your ratios tend to be lower than one might think um, in terms of cars per, per household. Um, and I've yet to see a project that I've been involved with and reviewed while on this board in almost nine years that where at least I became aware of a project that we approved that turned out to not have enough parking. It's usually the other way around. We have some extreme examples in town, but um, so I, when it boils down, what it boils down to is I'm, I think I'm satisfied with the parking and I appreciate the, the uh, numbers that you shared with us. Um, as was also mentioned, there are a number of other things that will need to be addressed prior to any final approval, and you know what those are, and you'll continue to work. And um, I'll just uh, amplify something I think that staff mentioned in one of their memos, that it's always helpful for us, for staff, and then by extension for us as a board, for applicants to sort of address concerns in a point-by-point -point manner 
um, so we can kind of track how those are being responded to and addressed. So that will be helpful going forward. Um, but beyond that, I don't think I have anything else. And um, I would move that we uh, grant preliminary site plan approval. Second. Okay. Have a second. All in favor? Or any discussion? Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> I just have one quick question. Sure. Um, you mentioned, I think, the main housing authority is the one that reviews the parking. Is, it, is that what you said? The main housing authority or main state housing or, or some some entity sure takes a look at your um, your parking ratio and everything. Uh, they don't look at the parking ratio, but they um, they provide financing for the project. So the um, the number, maybe, well, perhaps what I was referring to was the, the number of handicapped spaces on the site exceeds what the normal ADA requirements are, but that, because that's a main housing authority standard related to handicapped parking. I, I thought, it, I thought it may also, if I can just interject, okay. I think it may also, there was a reference to main state housing uh, that, that the proximity to public transportation is a yes. scoring criteria for the that's tax that's credit what, yeah. program. That and, might and be I guess I was just wondering how critical yeah. that was to this whole process, and I would assume it would be very critical to this getting. My understanding solid. and my experience is every point is critical, and it's certainly in the applicant's interest to make sure that they okay. they optimize that. Okay. Yep. Any Sorry. further discussion, Mike? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, did you? I mean, this this use is currently this this site is currently used to some degree. That's correct. There's eight apartments. There's eight site. apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any sense of what the traffic is like going in and out of that site as it exists today? Well, unfortunately, when we counted the traffic, no one came or went during the two hours that we count, or the, during the time period we counted. I, I don't know what to make of that. Whenever I've been there, there's been cars parked on the site. There's residents have been present. Um, you know, we would expect that that those vehicles would turn. Um, you know, sort of related to the left turn warrant, where we said that. Uh, Based on that methodology, you know, any project that has two left-hand turns warrants a left turn lane. Well, our project, you know, we're projecting based on these calculations that eight out of the 31 trips in that afternoon hour are turning left. Uh, it's about a quarter of them. So applying that to the possibly eight trips that may be from the residents that are there today, there's probably two trips today that are making that left-hand turn. So. Right. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, the, the numbers didn't bear out for whatever reason. Um, when we counted, no one came or went. <laughs> I, I have I, no I, idea what to make of that. I'm just curious, you know, today, uh, the, uh, the current use has been around for many, many years. And um, okay. have you come across any, any accident data or anything else that, that is a result of in and out of this site? Uh, well, yeah, actually, the, you know, in the traffic study that we, the original study that we submitted and in the revised one, um, that's probably worth noting. Um, you know, one of the criteria we look at is whether the, the segment of the roadway where the project's located is considered by DOT to be a high crash location. And that's defined by, by eight or more accidents in a three-year period with a certain um, severity ratio. This project, for, for this study, we, looked, we had to look at uh, accidents from 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, there were nine accidents, so one over the number of accidents limits and the, the severity ratio was such that, mm -hmm. um, that it became a high crash location. Um, not a lot of injuries, but uh, financial damage due to those. Um, one of the things that we noted with that, that of those nine accidents, um, four of them occurred in 2012, three occurred in 2013, and two occurred in 2014. The improvements to the project were built in 2013, so there was clearly a trend of reduced accidents. Um, and specifically, um, we think that the improvements that were done helped this project because the number of accidents associated with turns in and out of the flea market have specifically been reduced. Um, there have been no accidents um, at the intersection w that we're opposite the two entrances there since 2012. Um, so the, the improvements that were done in 2013 are clearly, you're seeing a, a trend in that. Mm -hmm. um, if we were in, I, we don't have, obviously don't have information for 2015 uh, yet, but if we looked at a different three-year period, it may no longer be a high crash location. So um, that's elaborated on in the traffic report um, in some detail. Uh, the traffic peer review engineer did ask for diagrams of all those accidents. They're all provided in, in what we've resubmitted. So um, we think from that standpoint, um, we're on pretty firm ground, but <coughs> understand there are other issues related to it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Thank you. Anything else? We still have a seconded motion on the table. 
All in favor? Does that have to be unanimous? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good luck. Item number nine on our agenda. Verizon Wireless requests a site plan review for a transmission tower at 239 Broad Turn Road, Assessor's Map R24, Lot 6. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you just know, the applicant is before the board uh, for review of a new transmission tower within the recently established Transmission Tower Overlay District. Um, in that district, uh, we have zoning provisions that speak to uh, the review criteria. And really, there's a, a two-step process viewing the transmission tower. Uh, the first step is a priority of location. Um, the, the town recently, as I mentioned, adopted the overlay district um, with the design of providing the planning board and applicants tools to direct a new towers to preferred locations. Um, the standards are really designed to provide for enhanced level of cellular, cellular coverage across the community while also trying to minimize the number of towers that need to be built to uh, satisfy the, the needs. So to that end, as I, I just uh, mentioned, there's sort of this two-step process. The first step in the process is to ensure that the location that's proposed meets the sort of uh, the uh, uh, ranking, rank order, if you will. Um, there's sort of four steps to go through, or at least three steps to go through before you get to a new location. So um, I think the board's first action will be work through. Again, the applicant is requesting a new transmission tower. Um, so it'll be to work through those first three priorities before you get to that fourth new tower and be sure you're satisfied before we delve into sort of the more uh, nuanced and specific design criteria. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, i turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. Um, just a couple procedural notes before we get into things here. Uh, this is the second one of these that we've seen since the ordinance was adopted. Um, and so we're still sort of fine-tuning our process and trying to make it as thorough, deliberative, but also as hopefully streamlined as possible for everyone's benefit. Um, so we're kind of learning from our experiences as we go along. Uh, I want to thank staff for providing some clarification and direction on um, how the board is to proceed through these steps. Um, as Mr. Chase indicated, uh, there's pretty clear direction uh, around really doing it in a sequential manner, uh, if, then, and so forth. Um, and uh, the way that I would like to approach this, uh, hopefully to ensure an efficient conversation and a productive conversation, would be for us to first hear the applicant talk about the priority location criteria. And what I would like to do is take those one at a time. So have the applicant review A, existing transmission towers, go through that. Then we'll turn to the board for each item and we'll determine whether the board is satisfied that based on the applicant's presentation and peer review's comments uh, that that criteria has been met. Then we'll move on to the next one, B, and so forth. Um, if we make it all the way through and we're satisfied that the um, priority location criteria have been satisfied, what I'd then like to do is have the applicant turn to step two the review standards for transmission towers. That gets into some more kind of qualitative, more nuanced uh, discussion. The first part of it, step one, is sort of you either meet it or you don't. Um, the second step, after you've presented on that, I would like to open it up to public comment because at that point we're getting into again to more kind of nuanced qualitative criteria. Uh, and then once we've heard any public comment, we'll turn to, to board discussion and we'll sort of see how things go and, and how far we progress. And I would just also ask that the applicant, um, I'm sure you have a lot of great information, um, just ask that you try and keep it as succinct as possible. And I think that'll be to your benefit as well, it'll kind of keep us all, all focused. And um, we'll go from there. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. 
Great. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott Anderson from Beryl Dana. I'm here tonight with Chip Fredette from Vital Site Services. Chip and I worked together uh, in Maine on uh, identifying and permitting new wireless facilities for Verizon Wireless. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're going to cut my comments short because that was half of my procedural overview of what we were going to try to do. So we're going to try to get right through it, uh, get, get right to it, and talk about the priority of the locations and answer any questions you may have. The Woodard and Kern report was very helpful, I think, and tied in with the, uh, the RF report that we had submitted. Um, just very briefly, this is a, a, a new tower, 120. Uh, foot proposed uh, new tower on a 60-acre site in West Scarborough, um, but for purposes of the priority location, um, <coughs> the chairman is absolutely right. This is a new tower proposal, so we'd like to walk you through um, very briefly the the overall uh, system requirements and the system goals for Verizon Wireless in Scarborough, which I know some of you heard about when we were going through the process of revising the ordinance. Then talk about some of the more specific plots that we've we've given. The, the key here is um, tab H in your application for this priority of locations, which is the radio frequency report. So what I'd like to do is walk through a couple of the kind of the documents that visually show you what we're trying to do here. Some of them are in the report. We've made a blow up of some of them here uh, just because we thought it would be more helpful. Um, and, and then we'll try to get to that kind of ABC um, as quickly as we can. So the, the first one to start with probably is attachment F to the RF report. Again, that's a tab H in your application packet. One of the requirements of the ordinance is to show you every tower that we have within 10 miles of the proposed site. And this will give you kind of the big picture overview and then we can kind of make it uh, smaller. And as I go here, uh, Chip is just going to jump in if I stumble on something because um, he's been uh, intimately involved with the build out of the network as well. So I'm going to take a crack at it and then he'll jump in. So what you see in this is the other Verizon wireless sites that are located within a 10-mile uh, radius of the proposed site. You can see the center, the one we're calling the Scarborough 4, it's the blue uh, designation in the center. Um, all of the black sites around the edge show um, existing Verizon wireless sites. And what we're trying to do in uh, Scarborough is to kind of fit within the different options that you have in your ordinance as much as possible. Um, so we have um, received a permit from the town to do uh, a stealth facility that's in the congregational church in town. That's one that you won't see that will provide coverage but doesn't require a new tower. We're also working with the town potentially on what are called macro cell sites on um, light poles and, and signal poles in front of Hannaford and Cabela's that would enhance service in those areas without having to um, construct a new uh, uh, tower. We're also, the other uh, project you have before, the Mariner Tower, which is up a little closer to 114, that is likely to become part of our network as well to improve coverage, and we would be able to use that tower at the height that Mariner has proposed, and we've already started some discussions with Lou on that. We do a lot of uh, sites on his towers. Um, and then this tower fits, and as you can see in this 10-mile radius overview, you know, from Saco into Scarborough, that corridor in the middle, that is where we're missing um, coverage right now. So uh, there is some coverage on transportation corridors in the area, but there is an enormous increase in the use of wireless in residential areas and also the amount of data. People don't use them for phone calls anymore. They're doing Pandora and Google and mapping things. So the, the draw on the system is significant. So this is kind of the big picture view and we're trying to fill this gap in the middle. Um, then if you go to, and I'm gonna chip, I'm gonna give you this just in case you wanna jump in. If everyone could go kind of back in the report to attachment A, I think chip has a big blow up of attachment A on the board there. This is the plot that shows, now we've kind of focused in a little more. This is the plot that shows the gap in coverage that we have in the, in the closer quarters of the West Scarborough area here. And you can see Scarborough 4 in the middle and you can see the coverage from 
um, what is the Scarborough Site 182, that's Scotto Hill Road, that's one where everybody's on, it's been there since 1992. We've got sites in Gorham and Buxton that are kind of filling out the periphery, and the Scarborough 4 site is uh, located in the middle, and this shows the, the lack of coverage that we have in this area. If you then flip to the next um, color graphic, which is attachment D, this shows um, the coverage from the Scarborough 4 site in conjunction with the other existing sites. Um, and this is kind of the, this is the hot map. This shows you where the, the, the strong footprint of the site will be. Um, but there is another document, if you flip over into the next one, we don't have blow-ups blow of this, but it's in your packet. There's some multicolored ones that will follow. Um, the first one is the before shot of these different colored areas. And you can see Scarborough 4 in the middle with a lot of white, which is the lack of coverage in that area. And then when you flip over to the next one, you see a dark blue area, which shows kind of the impact of the new site in relation to the sites that are surrounding. And there's two things that a new cell phone site does. First, it provides coverage where you don't have existing coverage. And then what's happening right now is all of these sites in the periphery are trying desperately to get into this area, but they're not doing a very good job. So while folks are trying to download um, things and use their phones at the 4G or the LTE level that most of the customers are expecting. You don't have that kind of coverage here. So the, the, the new tower provides new coverage where there isn't any, and then it also helps to uh, provide coverage where other existing towers are currently trying to provide coverage, but it's not working. Um, and so the blue kind of shows you that the other one we looked at was, okay, here's where if you got rid of all of the other towers, you would see what the coverage would be. But in conjunction with the others, they work together, and this will unload some of the load from these adjacent towers and kind of fill the gap more completely. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Sure. When, you, when you're referring to other towers, are you talking about just Verizon? That's correct. Okay, no other. Okay. All right. That's okay. correct, okay. yeah. So everybody now has their own, and now we're years and years ago there was roaming, and basically customers were, like, were, were not paying for roaming. So now each carrier has their own network. The response to that has been co-location, which is why on a lot of these towers you see three or four bands of antennas, and that's because multiple carriers are providing their own coverage, but they're able to do it sharing the, these different facilities. So this um, is the kind of mapping that shows us, oh, and one other thing I should show, uh, Chip, you should put up the search ring. This is helpful. This wasn't in the RF, but when I read through the Woodard and Curran, I thought this might be helpful. What, what happens is, you, you saw the, the, the plots that showed the gap in coverage in the middle. What happens is the radio frequency engineers identify these gaps, and then they send CHIP something that's called a search ring. And the search ring is a, a topographical map with a diagram, and this is RF way of telling CHIP, CHIP, you go find me a tower, 120 foot, which is the, uh, in, uh, the, the proposed height for this site, roughly within this area, and you will meet the coverage objectives that we're trying to, to, to fill when we fill this gap. Um, and so CHIP gets the topo, tax maps, landowner you know, information, and that's the, the kind of first step that CHIP uses in trying to identify someone who is willing to host a site, and not everyone is willing to host a site. And the search rings have been shrinking over the six or seven or eight years that I've been doing this. The first time we were just trying to like get voice coverage out there to people where there was none. Now, because of the demands on the data, um, we need more sites, but we're doing more lower sites. We're doing churches. We're putting them on you know light poles. We're doing other creative ways to to put more capacity into the system without building new towers. And so these search rings have been shrinking, and this is the sh search ring that CHIP was given for this site, and, um, which gives you a general sense of the location where we need to find a new site in order for it to fit and close the coverage gap that we're dealing with. Um, so maybe I, I just be, I, uh, what I'd like to do now is kind of go through the priority of locations, but I want to, this is a lot of information and a lot of <coughs> color, and I just want to make sure if folks have initial questions before I get to the priority locations that we can answer any questions you might have. Do you want to have anything? I, I'll just make the general point sure. um, for, for the board's benefit that, um, again, a lot of this is new to us in terms of the specific technical data and, and depictions that we're seeing here, but 
Um, I think there is an analogy, as staff has pointed out to us, to some other things we've looked at in the past and where we've relied on uh, peer review to look at things that are quite technical, like stormwater um, and, uh, and items like that. So I, I think that's the general principle here is that um, we're, we're going to be relying a fair amount on our peer reviewers, and we're not really in a position to sit here and necessarily second guess these propagation maps. Um, that's not to say that we, you know, that we may not have some, some valid questions, but I just wanted to put that out there. Does anyone have any things before we get into the specific uh, priority location I criteria? Do. Sure. They really haven't, as far as I'm concerned, they have, as far as the criteria, they haven't addressed A yet on why they can't use the tower that's nearby on my understanding is that that's what meadow. they're about to, to do. Is that what you're about ready to do? Yes, I think so. Technically explain why you can't use that tower. It is this, okay. You were talking about heights issue, so if it's not high enough then you can possibly put something on a telephone pole nearby. And explain to me it's only seven tenths of a mile away and if you look at some of your data on these sheets, it's about the same elevation as far as ground, and when you look at it, it, that area looks like it would cover just about the same as you're going to cover with your tower. So explain to us in detail, or somewhat detail, yep. on why that doesn't work for you, whether it's your choice because it's equipment choice, or whether it's a lease choice. And one more, sorry, <laughs> sure. one more thing, um, just, and again, this is based partly on kind of learning as we go on this. Um, one thing we want to try to avoid is, is getting into, you know, conflating these threshold cri uh, criteria with some other things that, that might be more, yeah, might I fall under part two. I talked know, to Dan. Screening and said don't talk about screening so, first. And, they, and that's, yeah. that's part of what happened last time is we got sure. into that mud, and I want to make sure that we're very clear, and, and I know it may feel a little bit awkward I, and herky-jerky, but we want to make sure that we're being really I agree. There's some site issues and whatever that we all deal with down the road. Let's exactly. deal with this right. siting issue. Make us comfortable with that. Perfect. Right. We'll move forward. Right. Roger. Yeah, Corey. Uh, when when you're doing your site search, do you take into consideration, for instance, what Mariner's considering doing? Does that come into your equation at all? Or? We can, especially if we know that it's happening. So you know, Chip is looking at. First of all, all existing sites that have been constructed already, and 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 what's happening is RF is looking at this when they do like the 10 mile radius search. That's the information they're working with, and they're identifying these gaps. They find a location where we need a tower in this area, and then Chip Chip's role, first and foremost, is it, is AT&T. Does AT&T have a tower anywhere near this search ring, or is there? a building on a hill or a church steeple or, or something that would allow us to, to meet those coverage. Um, so looking at initial structures is always the first step because it is the usually the easiest, simplest, cheapest, quickest way to get your facility up and running because the you know, most objections are to the tower. It's not that there's antennas there making people cell phones so much better. It's if you can put them inside a church steeple or on an existing building, that usually, you know, people support those uh, very much, and it's a much quicker way to go. So that's always step one, which I think is why you set up your priority of locations with A being you, you make sure there are no existing towers in this area, and we have to explain to you why we've done that search and haven't found any. Okay. okay. And I kind of want to piggyback on that. I think um, procedurally as we go through these as a town, I think it would be helpful if we actually, and maybe we do and I just don't know about it, had a list of every cell site in the area as maybe as part of a pre-application checklist. Make sure that you know anyone coming to us that's going to apply for a new site has that list and has, has been able to show us that we are aware of these locations and because we're all going to, every time one of these comes in front of us, we're going to say the same thing. Did you try AT&T's towers? Well, where are AT&T's towers on these maps? Well, they're not here. You know, how do I know there's not one, you know, 200 feet down the other way? I don't. I personally don't know. So maybe as part of a procedural thing that we can do as a town is have a comprehensive list of site locations in town and have that somehow 
available to us as a planning board when I look at this map and see Verizon wants to put a tower here, now I can find out if AT&T has one on Tibbetts Road. You know, I, I think that would be helpful, not just for us, but for the applicants, because that gives them the focus to come in here and say, you know, here are all of the towers that are located in this specific area. Um, and we have a coverage gap here in the middle of it. Obviously, clearly, graphically, none of those towers are going to help us right now. Um, so we're on to the next step. You know, I mean, it's, it's almost a quicker way to check, check that off. Don't know if it's possible, but I would think I think the town should I take agree those that would be steps. Helpful. Well, and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of information in this RF report. But if you go to page five, um, uh, in again it's a tab H of the RF report. There's a table that our RF engineer did identifying and surveying, and this is in the text itself. So if you're looking in the colored, go back up into the text. It's um, page five of the text portion, it's it's section. Out. At the tab H. Tab H. Tab H. And so um, there, and some of these are outside the 10 mile radius, but RF has kind of this running inventory. Although, you know, what you've suggested, Mr. McGee, makes perfect sense. As the town gets more applications, you can kind of cull from them the information that the applicants are giving you on where. And it's possible that someone could miss a tower and you could kind of generate a universal list of places. There's also an FCC tower database um, that a lot of, like the standard main wireless ordinance requires you to give a list from the database. So you can punch in latitude and longitudes and pick a distance and it will identify all <clears throat> structures with FCC licensed antennas on them within a certain database. So that's another good tool that we use in trying to identify existing structures and that's kind of publicly available that you can kind of piggyback on. I have a quick question as a sure. follow-up if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, mm -hmm. Does that include the stealth locations? Are those kind of just known towards the private carriers themselves? or is any location pretty much listed in that database. Anything with an FCC license. So this, like church steeples will be in there as well. Building mounts will be in there. Flagpoles. What was the name of that website? Uh, it's the FCC Tower Database. Thank you. Sure. And going to this kind of co-location issue, um, um, for all of the carriers as part of our FCC licenses, making our facilities available for co-location is part of our obligations as licensees under the Telecommunications Act. So um, it, it's a very common uh, uh, situation. One carrier, and Mariner is a perfect example. AT&T is the anchor <coughs> carrier for Lou's Tower, and they'll take whatever the top height is. There's usually an 8 to 10 foot separation, and um, other carriers are um, as part of the kind of the FCC regulation of the industry, um, required and encouraged to make their facilities available to each other. So um, our fenced-in area, which is 50 by 50, is large enough to hold at least two, if not three more uh, carriers' equipment shelters, and we're within a 100 by 100 lease area, so the fence area can be bumped out if an additional carrier needs to be added. So the, the towers are are replaceable and extendable, like our facility here at 120 can be redone to go to 150 based on the same foundation and structural support at the base of the tower. Um, so, and, and it's because when Verizon Wireless comes into the town, they're looking for an AT&T tower, so we make them available for ATT and Sprint and T-Mobile and everybody else, because on that level, the, the industry works pretty closely together. Thanks. All right, sure. All right, so let me start with A, and then you can dig in with additional questions. All right. Um, so I, I went through the Woodard and Kern. When we looked at the ABC, we saw it as, do you have any existing towers, like the tower we're building? B was, can you go to the industrial zone? And then C was, are there any other structures in the area that would work? Woodard and Kern kind of collapse them into an A and a B. And, um, and kind of going off the Woodard and Carmen report, I'll, I'll talk about them this way, because I think there's really one site that both we looked at and Woodard and Kern looked at and concluded it wouldn't work, and that is the, the stick site that's an AT&T site that Woodard and Kern identified in its um, a plot, and that you can see, Chip can probably point out the location on the search ring. I think it shows the stick is just outside of the search ring. 
So this was close, but there's two problems with uh, this. The, the primary problem is the height above ground level. So this uh, stick is uh, 90 feet high, so it's a little smaller. And when you get into these uh, kind of non-tower structures, usually they're structures that run between 75 and 90 feet. It's hard to do a 120-foot flagpole or stick because it just doesn't look like a stick anymore. It looks like a massive tower, and structurally you can't make it work. Um, so the, 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 the first available height on this is 75 feet. So we're comparing 117 foot center line of the tower that we have with 75 feet of, the, of what would be available next on this tower um, that's existing there. So, and I think after I saw the Woodard and Kern, I asked our engineers to run a plot, and I'd just like to hand you out that plot because it kind of shows what the difference is. Scott, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Quick. Um, again, Chip Fred out here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Um, the real issue here isn't so much uh, coverage as the pole that USL built out on Long Meadow Road at the park is a single user pole. It is not designed for co-location. So even if it were of a height that would work for our engineers, there's no space for Verizon Wireless. It's meant just for US Cellular, which is the same as the other facilities in town, uh, <coughs> Black Point Road Fire Station, Pleasant, uh, Pleasant Hill yeah. Fire Station. They came through in 2005, 2006 maybe, um, and hit a bunch of municipal, you know, town-owned properties because, they, because the ordinance wouldn't allow it otherwise. So they're, they applied under municipal use, and they're all single usable. You can't co-locate on them. In fact, when I first approached January 2013, I approached Tom Hall about the possibility of co-locating on the uh, Black Point Road site. We looked at it. I pulled the file from the building inspector's office, and sure enough, they're all these single-user stealth, stealth stick poles. Uh, a deal was made with the town apparently that if they, you know, you allowed police or fire on it, it becomes municipal use, which is a common, common. We, we've done it as well, um, but it's not designed for us. So you'd have to tear it down and build a new one anyway. So it's not a, it's not a usable structure. So, so this is at the uh, recreation area. Is that what this is? No. So what, that, what I just hung. At, so basically, we have like a structural and an RF. We looked at it for both both ways. So what Chip was talking about was structurally, these smaller scale poles aren't strong enough to hold multiple co-locations. So the, that's the downside. The upside is they're usually much shorter and they're much smaller in volume. So they can provide for one carrier really good coverage in an area, um, but it's not as available for co-location. We also asked the RF engineers to run a plot at the 75 feet, which if you then compare it with, and I think if you take the search ring down chip and show the next one, which is the proposed coverage from this site and how it fits in, um, you can see kind of a, a general comparison, and this is a, also attachment B in your report you can look at in, in comparison to the document that I just gave you that shows here's what, here would be the coverage from 75 if we could go on it, which we can't, as compared to the 117 <coughs> foot of the project that we proposed. The, the primary problem is not only is the, the stick not, wouldn't support the equipment, but it's too far to the east and it's too low in elevation to fit the gap that we're trying to with the remaining towers that are currently existing in the area. And Woodard and Curran reviewed the RF report, um, identified this stealth tower, and concluded the structure is defined as a stealth tower and only stands roughly 90 feet tall. Due to the stealth design and limited height, it will not adequately support the area with LTP coverage. Woodard and Kern also identified one additional tower structure near Merrill Brook Road um, and then similarly concluded it was not adequate. It's a similar height and is unable to adequately support the applicant's needs. So, uh, you know, that one was not one that we had done on RF. This goes to Mr. McGee's point that there may always be one that you didn't know about. So Woodard and Kern also evaluated that one and concluded it, it did not um, uh, meet the coverage objectives of the site. Um, so for number A, whether it's kind of A and C, new you know existing towers or existing alternative structures, we reviewed and evaluated um, the existing structures in the area where we needed to provide coverage and concluded that that existing structure, the stealth pole, did not work. And we believe Woodard and Kern uh, agreed when they reviewed our report uh, with our conclusions. 
All right, thank you. Any questions or comments on that? Uh, the Mariner Tower. Yes. Uh, it's going to be, what, about three miles away? Roughly? A little... According to the scale I just looked at. A little less than that, but something like that, yes. Would that fulfill your needs if that tower was approved for us? No. Um, no question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Chip. Uh, Chip, Chip here again. Uh, the, the answer is no. The plan is to actually use both. Uh, taking a step back, um, we were actually looking at a different piece of property to serve uh, the area that Mariner is proposing a tower. Now, now Mariner is proposing a tower on behalf of AT&T. It's really Mariner doing a build to suit. Okay, it's AT&T search ring, right? Okay. Uh, we were actually looking at the property uh, across the river. Uh, truth be told, and then during the uh, rezoning, uh, rather during the zoning amendment for the transmission towers, uh, we also learned that the zoning of that our particular candidate lot changed. We're now no longer the golf club is no longer in the telecommunications zone. So we were left a little bit high and dry. However, across the river, along comes AT&T and Mariner Tower. And I had my engineers run it, if you will. They took a look at the, uh, the propagations, and that's going to help to fill in some of this white area you see up here. So we're looking at using both, okay? So the range for you guys right now is technology is three to five miles, roughly? Less than that. Less, sure. And, that, and that's, not, that's not a limitation on how far we can project the coverage. That's a limitation based on the actual demand in Scarborough. Uh, the footprint here looks small, but there are so many people that live in this area that the demand for the demand for data, as Scott mentioned, is so great that we don't want to serve a large area. When we talked to Tom Hall and Dan Bacon two years ago, we said, you know, what, is, what are your plans? I said, we'll, we'll come to 100, 120 foot sites peppered around, because to serve, to build one tall tower, like they did back in the old days, Scott Tower Hill, 180 foot tower on the tallest peak, boom, let's cover as much as we can. And that worked for a little while, right? Uh, but here now with 4G and all this crazy stuff you can do with your phone, here we are with the high demand and let's not serve. In, in fact, uh, at this proposed height, my engineers will generally design the antennas, the configurations so that you can down tilt the antennas to control just how far out you do send the signal. Because uh, you cover too big of an area, uh, the site becomes overloaded. Yeah, because one of the things you're trying to do is fit the signal into where you have a gap but not overlap with other existing towers. So, um, you know, 120 actually works perfect for this site be, given the proximity to the other sites. You could build, I mean, in the, uh, round one that we started, you know, eight or nine years ago, we made them all 195 feet because that was five feet under what the FAA required to be lit. And you were just trying to cover these big plots as much as you could get um, as possible. And now, um, because of the change in the signal and the frequency, we actually need to be closer to the ground and we need to be more strategic so that we fill gaps without having overlap. Because what you don't want is when you're in an overlap, your phone keeps looking to two different towers and it you know, drains your phone and it creates problems with the signal. So it's a little more delicate of a process, but you know, the good news is we've been able to work with smaller towers um, in order to kind of meet these fourth generation coverage needs. And fifth generation. And fifth, that's right. I assume these are going to be good for 10 years and can be adopted <coughs> for 6G, which that will probably won't be that long. Yeah. Five years from now. Yeah, we do antenna swap. We've been doing a lot of antenna swap outs as you go from 2, 3 to 4G, and that covers your the changes in technology. Thank you. Roger, do you have something? Yeah, I'm just uh, kind of curious, based on uh, the state of part of the technology right now. Do you think that between Mariners and what you guys are proposing, that would suffice or provide all the necessary coverage for this area west of the, west of the turnpike? Or do you see that, do you think that it's going to be a need for another tower somewhere? Well, from where we're going kind of northeast to where Mariner is, that will I think that will cover the areas that we're trying to cover. Um, you know, there's still areas more to the south that still have gaps in service that we need to sort out, and, and I'm not sure that we're kind of there yet on what a site might be for that one. Um, but uh, but this should address kind of the area that we're showing we're going to hit, and then moving northeast up towards the golf course and 114 in that area where the Mariner Tower is proposing to go. All set, Roger? Yes. Anyone else on this one? No? Nick? <laughs> <laughs>
So B. All right. Moving on to B. A, B, C. So um, B, um, I, everybody saw B the same, which was the industrial and light industrial zoning districts. Um, I think you know kind of generally where they are in relation to where our search ring is. Um, and so the coverage that is necessary for this site is, and Woodard and Card noted, up to maybe three miles away from where you have an industrial, light industrial zone. Um, again, when we get up in that area, we, we, we have the church site. Um, we will have some that we're hoping that the town is interested in pursuing that might be along Route 1. That may address some of it when you start to get up in the area where industrial, light industrial is, and we will always be looking looking at that if we're up in that area, but we have pretty good coverage in that area from some of the sites in Cape Elizabeth and Portland and kind of on the periphery there. So um, right now, West Scarborough is what we're targeting, and these other um, districts are not close enough to meet the coverage objectives, and we think put it in current reviewed what we had done and agreed with us that the, those locations were too far away. Anything on that? No. Okay. And so Woodard and Kern just had A and B. I think they kind of, I think that this AT&T stick was more of a, you know, C. Are there any other structures that aren't towers that might meet it? But I think either way we've kind of talked about um, there are no existing cell phone towers built as cell phone towers. We don't have any stealth facilities, buildings, or other structures um, that we can put our antennas on that will meet the coverage objectives. And we're not able, at least with this project, to serve the coverage needs in the industrial or light industrial zone. Um, and Woodard and Kern reviewed that and I think concluded that, that we had done our math right, um, which then gets us to the, the last piece, which is, okay, you can do a tower, uh, a new tower, uh, provided now we go to this other area of the ordinance where we've got to meet a bunch of other um, uh, uh, terms and conditions and, and standards. Um, but we want to make sure you're kind of comfortable with this priority of locations analysis first. So before we move on to that, um, just want to make sure everyone's in agreement that that we're satisfied that this is where we are. Yep, I'm comfortable with it. Between the presentation, the uh, questions that have been answered, and the input from the peer reviewer, and I think I think that's where we are. So. Let's move on to step two. You can uh, great. Could you walk us through walk us through your compliance and, and other thoughts on that based Super. on uh, peer review comments. Are you going to give our public public comment when we do? No, my my thought was we would we would have the applicant give a okay. hopefully fairly brief overview of that, and then we would open up to any public comment so from there. Great. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll do kind of a, a it's a, these are relatively simple sites. We have a um, um, 120 foot high tower. The antennas are mounted kind of at the top, so that we say the center line is 117. That's what the engineers use. There's really two primary components to any uh, raw land site, a new tower site. You have the tower, and then you have the equipment shelter, which has the electronic equipment, the backup generator, um, can, and these are prefabricated structures. Um, the site plan shows elevation drawings of the tower and the equipment shelter. Um, it's a prefabricated structure. It comes in on a flatbed. It's got all of the equipment inside, and then they run um, a fiber cable up to the top. Um, we're located in a 50 by 50 uh, fenced area within a 100 by 100 lease area, which gives us some flexibility on bumping out the fence for additional carriers. Um, certainly the fence area could handle two additional carriers. Verizon's uh, equipment shelters tend to be slightly larger than some of the other carriers, and I'm not sure why. Um, sometimes it's the, the generators in, on the inside. We have two rooms. You, you can see there's two doors. One is to the generator room and one is to the equipment room. Um, but also the, the fence area can be bumped out to accommodate additional carriers if, if, if some are interested in using the site. Um, and then we have access uh, to Broad Turn Road. And a lot of the Woodard and Kearns comments went to the access road um, uh, um, that, and suggesting that we kind of get you folks some additional information, which we certainly want to talk about tonight so we can supplement what we've given you to make sure you have everything you need to review uh, the application. 
Um, so a couple of the big picture standards, we're under the height limit of 130, we're at 120 feet. Uh, we needed a 25 acre site, we have a 60 acre site. Um, initially you have to be 150 percent away from the closest property line. We're about 260 feet away with a 120 foot tower, so we meet that. There are a lot of buffering things you're going to look at, which includes this kind of a flexible floating setback that probably are best done by the board after we've done photo simulations for you to review, and Woodard and Curran kind of noted that. Um, we normally don't do those with the initial application because we always like to get guidance from the planning board as to whether there are specific areas in town you want us to take pictures from. Um, what we will do is we'll get our contractor out to fly a balloon at 120 feet. We can uh, let Jay know when that's going to be. So if you want to you know, let the public know when it's coming, we can try to do that. It's really finicky with wind. There can't be any wind. So sometimes they get bumped at the last second, but we could always kind of let you know. They'll run the, the balloon, and then our consultant basically drives around all the public roads He's got a set up with a computer and the whole nine yards and can track the location of the balloon. And then he will do a plot for you that shows in red where you can see the balloon from any of the public uh, ways. And also he will, any place that it pops up, on a public road, he will usually stop and take a picture of the balloon, and then he does a photo simulation and swaps it out with the tower. So you can get a general sense of what the tower will look like from these different um, locations. Um, so in addition to any place he spots the balloon, which he'll take a picture, if there were any locations in town that you were particularly interested in seeing, whether you could see the site from that location, we could add that to his list and, and make sure. Just to add to that, um, the uh, contractor will drive, just so you know, as a rule of thumb, he always drives all public roads within one mile diameter of the site. So if there was something you're concerned about in that area, we've got it covered. If there's something in addition beyond that area, you know, let us know and we'll add it to the list. So, so when I'm kind of looking at, um, so th that's kind of the basic rundown on the project. They're, they're pretty simple sites, the tower and the equipment shelter and the access road. Um, Woodard and Kern has suggested we get you, well, first of all, the fire chief is looking for a 20-foot road, and Woodard and Kern has suggested some additional information on the plan, which we can do um, by revising the site plan that we've given you in anticipation of the next meeting. So um, I think we kind of know our marching orders there, and we'll take a look at some of the standards about the culvert and the swale at the end of the driveway. Um, I, I was going to have Chip talk a little bit. One, th one thing they flagged was a boundary survey. It's a very big parcel, and we really have one or two boundary lines where the access road comes up where we are close to the boundary lines, which is where you want us to, and we want to have a lot of certainty about where our road is and where the property line is. And I just thought maybe, Chip, you could talk a little bit. We haven't done a full-blown boundary survey, but they have used, they found some pins, and they use some information to get us to the kind of hundreds of a foot on the location. And I, I wanted Chip just to talk about that, because that's our one waiver request, is for the full-blown boundary survey of the entire 60-acre parcel. Yeah, you, you, yes, Scott basically mentioned it. So I, when I spoke with our surveyor, Dan Staz, who uh, stamped the plan, um, naturally, as a surveyor, he's looking at this thing, well, geez, the Carters have a 55.68-foot wide, uh, uh, well, 55 feet of frontage here on Broad Turn Road. And Verizon Wireless, my client's proposing to build an access road and snake it between these two parcels. So naturally, he's just as concerned as we are to be sure that we land uh, on the Carter property. So uh, when, the, when the survey crew went into the field, they did survey this, not with a GPS, but with a total station, okay, which is accurate to the hundredths of a foot. Um, they picked up a number of different field monuments here, okay? Most importantly, they picked up and they, held, and they hung on to where they held, as the surveyor would say, uh, an iron rod here at the top of, or rather the bottom of lot 24-2, which marks the top corner of the Carter property with this abutter. And then, of course, there's an iron pin across the way. And with using those two pins and then using the math calculation, and I'm sorry, and another iron pin here as well, um, he is comfortable and was willing to stamp the plan to say that when we construct our road, uh, no matter which way you slice it, we are going to be able to follow and stay on the Carter property. So uh, I'm comfortable with it. He's comfortable with it. Um, 
I, I hope that you are as well. So. So that was the one waiver request, and I'm not sure we can kind of keep going through some of these big picture items, and then you mm -hmm. folks can come back to what you'd like to talk about. But that was one of the that was the one waiver we had requested, and and we think that we've done with the equipment that you do a boundary survey to identify exactly where that property boundary is, because it is kind of narrow there. And what we would propose is when we give you a, a supplemental plan with the wider road and some of the detail they're looking for. What are current is looking for? We'll, you know, put some notes on the plan or something to the effect that identifies the accuracy of the measurement and the calculation. Subject, of course, to Jay being comfortable with what we're sending your direction. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, if you don't have anything else that you wanted to put out there up front, um, anticipate we may have some questions, profile questions from the board, maybe some guidance for you for the next step. But first, I did want to open it up to public comment. Uh, just ask that uh, anyone interested in sharing comment uh, come up and briefly introduce themselves. Um, keep your comments to five minutes or less. Um, please direct any questions or comments to the board, not to the applicant. We will certainly do our best to make sure that any questions or concerns get addressed through the board, either tonight or going forward. Um, and we ask you try not to repeat what may already have been said. But with that, we'll open it up. Yes, and just provide your, your name and address, please. Sure. I'm Paul Williams. I'm uh, an abundant from the at 259 Broad Turn in Scarborough. And uh, I guess we, I just got this letter uh, last Monday that this was going to be proposed and built. So um, I also am learning about this and have done some just quick Googling and research on my own, and uh, obviously we're concerned with the health issues that you see many, many of the uh, recent studies and reports are coming out of these 4G towers now, I think, are producing a 28 megahertz transmission, uh, I guess is what I'm learning, and uh, whether they're a, a, a directional or and then uh, the three different types of antennas, a directional, a pin, a point to point, or a uh, or sector. I guess we'd have to figure out which way those are being aimed or which way those radio waves are going and how they project. I just saw a study where in Boston they're eliminating the municipal towers from fire departments because the firemen are actually getting cancer. So this is just came out in 2012. Uh, uh, it's just alarming and concerning, and I think it should be, you know, I don't know a lot about it yet, but I'll uh, I'll certainly do a little more research in the next couple of weeks and and uh, voice some concerns at the next meeting, I guess, uh, and what we find, because that's my biggest concern. And I, I live right, I'm the little house in between the two pits in, in the woods, so, you know, I'm probably 400 meters away from that and that's, that's not very far and from what I see it doesn't take five years before you start getting symptoms of something so that's my concern and I think anybody else is concerned that be here. Thank you. Thanks. Well, by the way I have uh, Verizon coverage. I run a business from my house. I have perfect service and uh, it works I have 3G, and it works my cell phones well, it works my computer well, and everything right there works pretty well on my Verizon service in the last 10 years. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Going once? Okay. <laughs> All right. Come on down. I wasn't sure. Hi, I'm Michelle Greer. I live at 245 Broad Turn Road. I, I came over and said hello when we first moved in, I think. Maybe it was a couple of years afterwards. But, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, the little ones. <laughs> um, I, like, have a love-hate relationship for this project. Um, I love it because it's great for our communications and technology and for Verizon customers. And then <coughs> I hate it because we live, right, we're going to live next to this. And um, I love Scarborough. 
I grew up in Portland, a city girl, and I wanted to get away from it. And Scarborough was the perfect, perfect place to live, raise your kids. The school system is wonderful. Um, and then I get that beautiful letter, um, a butter. I'm more like a neighbor than a butter. Um, so I, I, I'm a little concerned. I really um, hope that the board um, gives us neighbors the opportunity to see this balloon that you're talking about. I really, really want to be there. Um, I have young children. The frequency thing, I researched it, and it doesn't, it won't affect you, I promise. My brother and, yeah, my brother and sister-in-law live in Seattle, and they actually own a company, and they build cell phone towers. So I got a lot of information through them with the health issues, and there really is very, there's, there's no, yeah, you know, but they're high enough and the poles are pointed in a certain direction that it shouldn't affect health issues, you know, bring up any health issues. My concern is um, aesthetic pers pers mm -hmm. you know, personal reasons. You know, I sit out in the backyard, have a nice fire, kids are running around, and then I'm going to look up and be like, oh, it's so pretty, look at the stars in a cell phone tower. So that's my issue. And then... Uh, the road going through is another issue. I think that's right behind our house. Um, I have two dogs and three young kids, and I will tell you, our German Shepherds do not like people. So when your men are going in and out, they will bark at you. <laughs> and I'm just going to give you a heads up, and it is fenced in. So but that's my two cents. Good luck um, on your project. And hopefully, I don't know, whatever. Hope you guys understand where I'm coming from. And I wish more neighbors came out because I know there are more that should be here because they're going to actually see this thing. And uh, I may see the tip of it, but they're actually going to see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, before we move on, I just want to briefly say that um, when we were, when the town was considering adopting this ordinance and we were talking about the planning board's role in reviewing this, uh, it was made very clear to us as a board uh, that this board does not have uh, uh, jurisdiction, if you will, over any potential health and safety issues that may or may not be associated with uh, cellular signals. Um, certainly, the applicants are obligated to uh, comply with all the federal regulations and any other applicable, applicable regulations. And while we certainly appreciate and respect concerns about that, it's not something over which we really have purview. Um, so I just wanted to put out there, put that out there, sort of for the record, and that's not in any way to discount any uh, concerns out there. But um, with that, I just, just adding to, to that. The the FCC, we cannot reject a tower on the basis of health. That's just not in our criteria. We can't even consider it. So, <laughs> out of our hands on that. However strong you feel about it, and I know some of the councilors really debated really hard over that when we changed this zoning. Right. Thank you. Mike, do you have any? Uh, comments or questions on this section? Just a maybe couple. Um, I appreciate uh, going as far as we are going to go tonight and then pick up with kind of the visual presentation, if you will, at the next uh, next meeting. <coughs> it's easier to absorb. Um, I live I live in Longmeadow, that uh, monopole, and uh, that we discussed that last last time we had I think AT and T in front of us. It was specifically built with one carrier in mind and also to serve some of the town's uh, emergency uh, needs. So um, that's very true that you know, no one else can occupy that tower as, it, as, as it's built today anyway. My question is, um, and maybe Jay can help me with this, but um, <coughs> Carterbrook Drive, was it not at one time planned to go uh, through this area and exit at the very 50-55 uh, foot right of way that 
you're going to use for this for this site? Uh, no, the, the plan all along was uh, is as shown. Uh, we were it was uh, when we approached the Carters. Um, the direction that we were basically given is that you know we'd like you to use this access here, um, and then this portion of the property. You know, we're some, as a uh, you know soliciting interest can be some of the hardest the hardest part of the job. And and uh, and when we talked with them, they felt that this was a better location on the property. That's, those are the rights we were given. Um, no, Carter Brook Road was never a, never a consideration for access. But okay. were you asking whether there was some prior yeah. thought that it would go all the way through? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah. So you're exactly right. As part of the yeah. Carter Brook subdivision, there was there is an existing 50 foot wide paper right away that does connect to the parcel. <coughs> Frankly, offhand, I can't remember if it saw designs come through this connection to, to Broad Turn Road or another one. Um, it may well be this one. I can certainly pull those plans out, but... Um, uh, right, yeah. So, well, uh, one of these locations, but you're generally correct. Okay. <laughs> if not wholly. Where are you headed with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, being generally correct is, is better than being wrong, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> Car Carterbrook Drive, well, I guess what, what I'm interested in is um, at how your site plan, how you're fenced in and your buffer areas and everything else. Uh, will end up looking uh, should Carterbrook Drive end up being built and exit on Broad Turn Road, uh, insofar as the plans or the, the uh, assumptions that we can make for that. Because yeah. there is something out there, I think. There is. For we can certainly pull out those plans for the applicant okay, to good. consider. Okay, that would be great. Yep. And I think it would help you also. You don't want to, you know, we have don't a full of folks. squash some prior approval or make sure, we want to make sure this fits in <coughs> with whatever was previously yeah, contemplated. ideally. And then, you, you know, there might be a few extra questions to answer, but uh, I think it would make for a, a neater package. Okay. Um, but other than that, um, I think everything I've heard so far was uh, well presented and uh, there's no reason for me to dispute the data. <laughs> and I'm, again, I'm looking forward to, uh, to your uh, visual test, if you will. Uh, you said that uh, the pictures will be taken from the public roadways, and you invited anybody. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're inviting the public also. Yes. That they might be able to contact you and maybe um, have you do that analysis from an area of their interest, potentially. Um, as a, as a, as a rule of thumb, for staff. Yeah, as a rule of thumb, yeah, a couple of things. Um, we've done hundreds of these. Uh, generally, they would, you know, voice any comment, concerns, or questions through you folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, back to us. It's easier than, than funneling voicemails that way. Uh, we don't take photographs from private property. If we I'm did sure that, that, we would... That's, that's understood. Never, yeah, yeah. yeah that's but we will, you know, if there's a town property somebody's concerned about, and it's something that might be uh, uh, his, of historic significance that may not be eligible under state standards, but maybe in town standards, uh, we'll look at that stuff for you as well. Uh, and. So what they do is they drive around, and he take, he'll take a photograph at a certain millimeter, uh, and we know the size of the balloon, and so he's able to scale uh, in Adobe Photoshop a, a tower that's very darn close to what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. um, he, and as Scott mentioned, uh, he'll, he'll GPS track the roads he drives. When he starts seeing a view of the tower, he'll mark it, start, stop, and he'll grab the worst case or best case, however you look at it, vantage point from that section of roadway, take the photo, and then move on. So, we'll, and we'll provide to you not just the before and after, but also a map showing that, showing that um, that drive. But we will do for all the neighbors. We will, they will do an assessment of the roads that go all the way around the lot. Uh, the, the it's a big lot, six acres. But they'll drive all of the public roads, and any place where the balloon is visible, they will take a picture. And also, we can make sure that we'll coordinate with Jay on when the balloon gets flown. So although you might not have a picture of it, you'll be able to go out on your property on the day we do the balloon test. Just note that the bottom of the balloon will be 120 feet, not the top. It, the balloon is almost as big as this room. But um, when you're looking at the balloon on that day, it's the bottom of the balloon that will be the top of the tower. And that's usually the best way with some public communication for folks who, if they have a spot on their property that they think they might be able to see it other than the public road, can go check it out on that day. Um, Thank you for that. That's, that's, that's kind of the dialogue I was looking for, sure. so I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. John? I'm good. Okay. Ron? 
I'm still assimilating everything. <laughs> All the colors are still assimilated away. <laughs> Nick. Yeah, I think. Um, I think you know. I'm, if I'm looking at my C1 sheet here, you've got the edge of your tower to the edge of the property line, but you kind of so the the distance between the road. I think in anything future, I'd rather see your distances to Close private to property, property yeah. lines. Um, and, and in that vein. Um, I believe we have uh, the planning board has up to a 300% uh, max. So if you get 120 foot uh, height, we can go up to 360 feet mm -hmm. from the nearest abutters property line. Yes. I think as a board, perhaps consider a, as a rule of thumb, maybe not a hard rule, but as a rule of thumb, any single family dwellings and property lines be respected at the fullest maximum extent. That's kind of just a, a rule of thumb coming out of us. It, get it as far away from a single family residence's property lines as we as we can. Uh, just to, to consider talks amongst ourselves, whatever it's going to be, but consider those things. You said that was about 240 feet? A little less than 260, we 260. think. 260. And we'll put no. that, uh, we'll put it on the you know, and I know, that's 200 percent. And um, the, you know, the other thing is it, it gives that flexibility is if this actually goes up to 150 feet someday because you have the ability to extend this another 30 feet. Um, you know, the, the three time maximum, we're now at 450 feet away from a property line. Just, just a second, we're not, we're not actually proposing 150. Um, we don't have the ability to go to 150. That would have to go in front of site plan review. We have the capability of designing the foundation in the tower itself to be extended up to 150, but that's not what we're proposing. So, um, I, for what it's worth, um, that, that's where we're at. We're not again. We're not proposing 150. The ordinance gives you the ability to, you know, to go beyond that. But that's not where we're we're looking for. Right. Um, but as far where I'm sitting, um, for any future co-location needs, I think we need to be prepared to uh, look at this site as potential future spot for other applicants. And um, in, in that vein, I think we should ask applicants to design theirs for. The extension, um, the, the foundation, be able to <coughs> that thing. just as a planning board. I think those are things we should be considering, um, because I know you guys want to pepper the land with these because it helps you, but I'd rather see fewer of them. Mm -hmm. So, the, if we're going to do it, um, you know, I want to see us make sure that we're we're installing something that can be built on and co-located in the future. So, that those would be my comments for right now. And then we'll, we'll make sure, you know, and the, the visual simulation can be really helpful um, because sometimes, um, the, based on where you have existing vegetation, um, the height and the location, the proximity can be very different depending on the existing topography. So I think it will be very helpful to see when we do the, the road test and see where the tower can be seen from, um, you'll get a sense of, okay, well, what's it going to look like from Broad Turn Road? and have a sense of what it looks like from the closest residential dwellings. And I can't even tell you right now because I haven't seen the Sims either, but that's usually a pretty good foundation to say, oh my gosh, look at that, that's ridiculous. It sticks way up there. What can we do about that? And that will provide you with some good baseline information as you're kind of thinking about the issues that you flag. But you're absolutely right. The board has that right to, to increase it. Um, um, and um, we've proposed the, the ones that shortest to meet our coverage objectives because we think that's your goal as well. But I think with the visual assessment, it, it can be helpful to kind of think about some of those issues. And um, quick, real quickly, just out of curiosity, if we asked you to be 300 feet away from that property line, this is posing an enormous issue for you to move it 40 feet up back from the uh, Reed property. Looks like it's the closest. Okay, you just have something. If, if we as a board ask you to be 300 feet away from that property line, is the 40 feet going to be a big deal to you at this point? Why would we do that? That's awkward. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Excuse me. Why would we do that? I mean, you're you're speaking for the board. No, I'm asking if it's going to be an issue. What, what I'm what I'm asking is, I want to know. We I mean, we have as a board flexibility to ask them to move their their tower 300, actually at this point, 360 feet away. We have that flexibility to do that, according to the ordinance. So if we wanted them to do 360 feet away from a property line, 
is it an issue for them? And I'm curious. Well, okay, my point is that I have not heard anything tonight that would warrant that in this particular instance. Right. That's and that's fine. But I, I'd still like to know whether or not that would be an issue possibly. I mean. And it, I mean, I think it could be because the lease has been negotiated in an area that the property owner thinks will put the tower kind of out and away from any anticipated use of the site. Um, but I think when we do the visual simulations, you'll be able to see uh, kind of what it looks like. At 120 feet, this is a relatively low site that is going to be shielded by a lot of the existing vegetation. Um, but after you take a look at that, if the board has concerns about its location, we could raise those issues with the property owner. Um, it's, it's just a little tricky to answer now because there's other things going on on the site. And we've been kind of asked to go in a certain location just because of what else is going on on the site. But, um, okay. but we can always explore things that are important to the board to explore, and I'm we will curious. definitely do that. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is our first, first second and a half exactly. time around because the last one didn't. Yeah, didn't we're going to try to give you as so. much information and but be as flexible as we can, because okay. we appreciate that the town has gone through an entire process to try to make this work for the companies, and um, we real, we're very grateful for that and feel very invested in this. So we're going to keep going with the back and forth with you as much as we possibly can. Appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Thanks, Nick. Roger. Um, going going along with what Nick was just saying, though, um, I, I was just kind of curious that the, the uh, Cotterbrook Drive there that Mike way down the end was talking about, you know, that that runs across and potentially would, where it, uh, would come out where that right away is that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, if if indeed that were to ever occur. How much of an effect would it have for you to move your tower to accommodate that? Well, we definitely don't want to move it um, after we build no, no, it. I mean before you build it. Oh, um, well, we'll take a look at yeah, the plans okay. with Jay and make sure we're not running afoul of either something that's planned or that would have to be addressed together. I mean, I'm not sure whether if there is an issue, we'll try to make sure there is an issue and we sort that out. I don't know what the issue would be, so I'm not sure whether we'll have okay. to do anything. But we would either have to make sure that we did what we did in a way that didn't violate a prior approval of this board, or we would have to ask you to revise whatever that prior approval was. And I'm not sure what the property owner would think or what the board would think, so. Yeah, actually, I just realizing that plan you have up there does show the extent of the right away <coughs> coming down Carter Brook to sort of the uh, northerly or easterly property oh, line there. The and line. so. That, that's really the extent of the right of way, and to Mr. as I see the alignment now, I think to, to Mr. Wood's point, if there wasn't a formal plan for a connection through this property, okay. but sort of conceptually it was understood that should a subdivision happen here, that that would be a logical sort of connection Second point. Access. So I think, you know, what I'm hearing from the board, it's probably worth in your, your due diligence before your next submission is understanding exactly how the location that you're proposing could impact that, and that could be part of the board's consideration moving forward. And do you think you have a, like a, a subdivision plan that might show something on their property, or is it just? We, we can dig back through okay. um, the file on that review process. That was just probably five or six years ago at this point, so we may have something. Because well, we can. Because what we tried to do is pick a site that the property <coughs> owner thinks will be out of, I mean, it's it's right in the corner of our search ring, so we're close there. We'd have to take a look at that. But more importantly, we're trying to do it with every landowner to make sure that in the future, whatever their plans are, that the site can remain and doesn't interfere with those. So that's kind of part of the back and forth with the property owner. But we'll explore that and make sure we're not doing anything that, that doesn't make any sense, Jay. Mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess I'm all set. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I don't think I really have anything new to add. Uh, just to, to recap, we we worked through the priority location criteria, and we have uh, reached consensus around that. Okay. So we can sort of check that off. And then beyond that, we've identified a series of mm -hmm. sort of follow-up items and uh, our homework, if you will, for, for next time. Uh, we'll want to see the buffering detail. We'll want to see the photo simulations, and as you suggested, those may uh, help inform our consideration of the 
in a potential discussion around future co-location, um, as well as some of these other considerations. Um, one thing that I don't think anyone has really spoken specifically to on the board is the question around the request for the waiver of the full survey. Good point. Um, so I'd like to, I guess, just have an informal uh, indication of whether where, where people are on that. I don't want to presume to speak for the board. I'm okay with it. Is that what that is? a waiver for the what? The public. The complete, the, the, com boundary the complete survey. boundary Tempest. survey is the one uh, like waiver. You said we wouldn't have that flexibility so according to the to grant a waiver. Did I misread that? Am I thinking the boundary survey? We do have that flexibility. Oh, we do right. have it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do. misunderstood. Yeah. We did not have that flexibility. Right. Um, Woodard and Curran suggested that that they go ahead and do it, but it's at our discretion. And what we would ask is that we can provide you with essentially a boundary survey of the the boundaries that run along where the road will be mm -hmm. and on the basis that there aren't any other project elements that are anywhere near any other property lines we would ask you to waive the requirement for the full boundary survey for the entire parcel just because that's very time consuming and expensive and has us going out and identifying the locations of the property boundaries where we're nowhere near um, the information that we would provide if you grant us this waiver would have to, basically what we're going to give you is the same level of accuracy for the property boundaries that are closest to this access drive, subject to review by Jay and by Woodard and Curran, which we think will be acceptable when Woodard and Curran and Jay and everybody gets that level of detail. And we revise the plan to show the 20-foot road with the additional stormwater information so we can show you that those improvements are also um, so we think it's a reasonable request that I assume if whatever we give you you don't like, you can drag us back and ask for additional information if it doesn't feel like it's enough. I, I think that's a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing anyone disagreeing. So, um, and beyond that, just uh, we appreciate your willingness to work with staff to sure. make sure that um, the public and particularly uh, including the, the immediate abutters and neighbors are aware of when the, when balloon the balloons test. will be done. And should we check with Jay on any particular locations Say, you would like us to shoot a picture from? Um, I'll take the liberty of saying that you'll be the conduit for that, uh, and to the extent that there's any any that there are any requests from the public, that Jay can be the point person for that. Jay Chase here, the planning department. Um, and Great, thank you. You've pointed out that there's you know that there's some uh, X factors there in terms of timing. Um, so folks just need to be aware of that. But it's usually a kind of an 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. because winds tend to pick up in the afternoon and that changes the height of the balloon. So it's usually early morning is when you get the best shot of the okay. of the balloon. All right. Well, uh, do you have any questions for us or any other feedback? I don't, like from us? I don't think so. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate folks that have come out that have questions, and there'll be, I know, other opportunities for neighbors to come out and talk and ask questions about the project. And so we'll pull together everything we can. We'll communicate with Jay about the balloon test and let people know. And when we have the package ready to go, we'll flag it and try to get back on your agenda as soon as we can. Okay. Thank so you. Thanks very much. I appreciate much you working time. with us on the process here, sure. and we'll look forward to the next step. Thanks. Thank you. Corey, if I might. For, for the benefit of folks of the public who are interested in following this, uh, by way of uh, a butter's notice, we do notification when an application first comes in. That's the only notification we do. Um, but certainly, if folks are interested in understanding when the balloon's going to be flagged, I think as uh, Mr. Fellows just said, please send me an email. That's going to be the easiest way for me because it sounds like it's going to be, you know, really very weather dependent, so it's going to probably be pretty short notice. Um, so when I get notified, I'll be notifying planning board members and anyone else who expresses an interest. Um, and then I'll just note for folks who do want to follow this, the board meets every three weeks. We post our agenda two weeks beforehand, um, and so you can um, see when, when the item's coming up. Our meeting agenda and my email is all online on the planning board's webpage. Um, and for the applicant, um, just as by way of general, uh, when ap as applications move through the process, <coughs> what the board likes to see is a response to staff and peer review comments in addition to 
any additional materials you're having, okay. just sort of point by point how you've responded, what changes they should be looking for in their plan, you know, in the document package so they don't have to flip through everything again and try to understand what's different, really okay. just lay out for them very clearly Great. what you've changed. So. And then for future meetings, um, are we, do we need to get you materials within the same application deadline for yes. each one of those meetings? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we probably won't make the ask. next meeting, but we'll be shooting for the one after that. Very good. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Is there a town planner's report? Uh, yeah, just like to make mention, and I, I know at least a few board members were able to attend the Higgins Beach uh, neighborhood meetings uh, a couple weekends ago. The results of those meetings um, are, have been posted online. That's, that's just sort of the notes, if you will, from the meeting. There, ha there haven't been any recommendations today. There, there aren't any zoning changes currently being considered. The committee is working through that process. So all that will be coming forward in the coming months. But what's online now is just a, a presentation of what was heard at those meetings. So, um, so board members and members of the public might be interested in uh, perusing that. Thank you. Administrative Amendment Report. I have one item to report. Camp Ketcha uh, had a request for two uh, pavilions or sunshade structures in their campground that uh, the board chair and staff reviewed. Um, and so those were approved um, for their site. Any planning board correspondence? I guess not. All right. Planning board comments? Uh, salt Jim, how'd you deal with that one? Haven't yet. Okay. Staff has uh, we're in has, contact. Has been in contact with them and requested a a, a write up explanation. Yeah. Right. And they will take it just for back. everybody uh, that didn't hear it. We approved a certain color design at our meetings, and they built it to a different color design. And I brought that up and. Hmm. We'll let Corey <coughs> spank the hand, and I didn't think we needed to bring him before the board. I just spank the hand. They're a developer. They've been around long enough. They should have known better to just come to Jay and say, we'd like to do this. And so that will presumably be the subject of a future administrative amendment report. Sure. Unless, so. unless things take a really bad turn. <laughs> Thank you. Is there something to sign? Is that Yes, there is one item to sign. It's the yeah. subdivision we approved at the last meeting. Um, Can you get an invite for Habitat to Humanities ribbon cutting Wednesday? The ribbon cutting is Wednesday. What time? Uh, it's offhand, I don't remember, 9 or 10 in the morning. Um, but I can certainly send an email around to board members if you're interested. I'll just briefly comment that I, along with uh, a couple other board members and you members of the town council and other boards had the opportunity to participate in the Higgins Beach workshop that Jay mentioned. It was uh, very well done, and um, I think they, the, the, both staff and the consultant that they brought in did an excellent job of engaging the public and really um, getting down at ground level and understanding the unique characteristics of that community and looking at um, how they might potentially refine the zoning to uh, through things like setbacks to try and um, make things a little bit more rational. Uh, and there's some good public input, and we'll look forward to seeing where that goes. Anyone else? With that I'd move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you.